This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. Welcome back, everyone, to the Gentleman's Wrestling Podcast. I am your host, as always, Jesse Collings. And uh, joining me here today, first-time guest, uh, he is the preeminent New Japan Pro Wrestling preview writer in all of professional wrestling. That's my opinion. I'm editorializing that, but I feel like wow. it's, it's okay to say that. Uh, he is a true road to warrior. He is a consistent voice of reason in the sometimes chaotic noise surrounding New Japan. He is the five-time reigning and defending champion of the annual Voices of Wrestling fencing tournament. A notable enthusiast for bulky men from Kazakhstan. An underrated member of the Voices of Wrestling Massachusetts Mafia. He likes to go under the radar out there in Western Mass, but yeah. as a West as a Western Mass supporter, I have to recognize it. Uh, in fact, he recently I heard rec- I heard this. I got a scoop right before the show that he recently returned from a trip to Big Y, which there's nothing yeah. more Western Mass than getting back from a trip to Big Y. Uh, oh, yeah. And he is the only wrestling writer whose work will make you think you stumbled into an excerpt written by David Foster Wallace. It's Jay Michael. Jay Michael, welcome to the show. Damn, Jesse, thank you. All right, so I, we, it's proven that I at least have one reader. I'm never totally sure. I get no feedback on any of these things. I, I've kind of made my writing wrestling proof by just being so self-indulgent with the language, but I nobody ever talks to me, so oh, thank you for that. Yeah, w- wait a minute. You're a supporter of Western Mass. You're from Western Mass. I, I am not from Western Mass. I'm from Waltham, Massachusetts, sir. What? But you said you went to school over here. Yeah, I went to school there. I didn't. I wasn't from oh, that, there. That well, look, that counts. That counts. I know exactly. No. You told me. Yes. So yeah, no big Y. Love big Y. Just dropped a big, big, big bill on that one. But you know, it's they're trying to be Whole Foods now. Do they still so, have the slot? Do they still have the slot machine you can pull after you go through the uh, the checkout aisle? No, they got rid of all that stuff. It's a fucking app now. You don't get the coins. You don't get the thing, the slots. That, yeah, it's just... that is that's awful because that's an incredible gimmick. I know, I know. Like people would guard those gold coins, man. And if you got one, man, yeah, you so go straight for, to the bank with it. For like the zero percent of listeners that know what we're talking about, because I don't know what our Western Mass uh, listenership is like. Um, Big Me? Y is is a is a is a pretty standard chain of grocery stores, and they had this gimmick where they had gold and silver coins that were essentially like coupons that would get you some free stuff. And like a gold coin was like pretty valuable. Like a gold, what would you say like a gold coins like net value was like six or seven bucks? Uh, I, I, whatever a rotisserie chicken cost. Yeah. So like you would get these, if you spend enough dollars or you, you know, sometimes stuff would be on sale. And you, if you bought like enough of them, you would get a gold or a silver coin and you could basically trade them in for, for other stuff. And uh, they used to have this gimmick where like, at the end of the once you like were checking out and you get your groceries bagged and after you paid they had like a legit like little slot machine that you could pull and yeah. you pull down and you like i don't know what the odds were on it but you could win some of these gold or silver coins and like that's so dumb that they got rid of that because that was an incredible gimmick and if the choice was to go to like big y or like walmart which like walmart might be marginally cheaper but I would still go to Big Y because, like, I still get that thrill of gambling uh, and pulling a slot machine arm. I mean, yeah. So I'm disappointed they got rid of that. Uh, uh, Big Y is way more expensive, I've heard, than Walmart. I mean, everybody that seems to move here, and I sort of just in the business I'm in, engage with people who aren't from around here. Every time they're in, they're like, Big Y is so fucking expensive. And I'm just like, well, they want to be Whole Foods. That's what they want. So yeah, it's just everything's on the freaking app. It sucks. It's not as it's not as endearing anymore. Yeah, I mean, Big Y used to be my go to Walmart was probably a little bit cheaper. Walmart would have like the occasional deal that would be like insanely cheap. Like they'd be selling like Briars ice cream for like a dollar fifty or something like that. Just like right. but Big Y was a little bit closer. Certainly when I was in college and I couldn't, I didn't have a car yet, I would walk to Big Y because Big Y was a lot closer. I went, I went to college in North Adams um, for anyone who's listening. Um, but uh, I was just at the Mocha the other day. Yeah. And you know what's right next to Mocha? Uh, Big Y, right? 
Big why? Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, anyway, this is boring our listeners. Um, how many people do you <laughs> think got that David Foster Wallace reference? Uh, me. Uh, probably Joe it, Gagne, if he listens. Yeah, I don't know. I told you before the show, I have a copy of Infinite Jest, but uh, don't ask me if I've actually read it. It's right next to my yeah. copy of Ulysses that I've also read maybe half of. Yeah, you know, I actually read Infinite Jest like a month ago. Wow. Um, which which set me up for this David Foster Wallace joke. Um, but um, I didn't like it. I didn't care for it. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, you know, it's like there's this novel, but then have you you've read the, the piece he wrote about uh, Federer, right? No. Oh, that's like one of the best pieces of sports journalism ever. You know, I might have actually so, and not realized it. As he's, you know, he had such a hard on for tennis, and oh, yeah, no, that's a that was an awesome, awesome, awesome piece. Yeah, I know Infinite Jest makes that clear too. But yeah, no, he's he was great. Really sad. I actually met um, one of his nieces or something. Was friends with one of my cousins and came to visit her once. And yeah, like everything that I heard was like he was a really cool guy. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know that much about him. I know Infinite Jest, I thought, was full of, like, a lot of, like, misogyny in uh, an extremely homophobic and transphobic book, is how I would was describe it? it. Yeah, oh, no. that's where... Well, so here's the thing, is, like, a lot of the... It's it's supposed to be very funny. There there are some elements of it that I do find funny, but it's it's so massive that there's a lot of the humor... What I would say, I would not, I would not say it's, like, like a, a, a total, like black mark on him i just think like a lot of comedy from the 90s has aged really poorly um in that regard like there's just like yeah. like a lot of the a lot of that stuff would be considered like homophobic now and i feel like sure. that's 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 where infinite jest lies the spectrum it's like watching you know like a 90s stand-up or like a 90s a raunchy 90s like comedy movie that like you're like wow they would never make this today no um, no kind of sense um but anyway, um, I'm sure I know most of our li listeners were um, tuning in to hear some David Foster Wallace um, literary analysis. Um, well, I mean, listen, and I can connect it to wrestling because, like, you know, if you're one of the few wrestling fans who are literate, you know, wrestling makes you almost forces you to compartmentalize because, like, there's just no sane way to consume wrestling and have any sort of ethical standard for the people you're watching. Thankfully, most of them aren't saying who they're voting for coming up, but we know who most of them probably are. You know, it's sort of like there, there's a, you know, as much as MMA tries to fight it, there is probably a deep connection between somebody who wrestles and somebody who, you know, beats people up for a living. Yeah, I mean, just, I mean, just gym, gym bro vibes in general. People yeah. that spend a lot of time in the gym tend to be politically leaning one way or the other. I, I would actually wager that most wrestlers don't vote at all. Oh, that's actually a better point. Yeah, right. Like, probably for the best. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think a lot of them like other might have political opinions, but don't actually end up voting. Um, people don't. Uh, people who don't like, uh, you know, people. These people land on their heads for a living. We we can't overlook that. But that, I mean, it's like that with everything. It's like people, right? People like if you really like someone people have this tendency to like project their own political feelings like onto this person because they want this person to be like the perfect person in their eyes. Yeah. Um, but certainly with athletes, like across the board, like um, probably shouldn't be thinking like that. Um, well, the shrewder ones pick up on that and we see how that ends when they're sort of publicly espousing whatever they think their fans want to hear. And then generally they always get caught. It usually ends very badly. I, I, will, I will say this. I was 100%. I saw right through David Starr. That's like one of my like, I don't really call it a win, but like I knew the David Starr, like socialist stuff was a gimmick. And the fact that he there was like a one or two year period where like he was just super over in large part because his political espousings aligned with the UK indie uh fans and i was like there's right. no way someone is like, like like this in real life like this is clearly like a gimmick like i know when a wrestler is doing a gimmick and then i kind of came out that he was like essentially like playing up everything for attention and for uh, his gimmick and it worked yeah. for him for a brief period of time for sure um a bit. one last uh, thought on uh, david foster wallace if you ever read uh infinite chest uh it's written in a very specific way is is a kind way to say it 
And after I finished the book and I was like, I got to know what people think about this. And so I made the mistake of going on Goodreads and like, I'm going on Goodreads. Oh, no. and I'm reading these reviews and like at least half of the reviews on Goodreads, the people who wrote the reviews wrote them like in this style of the way David Foster Wallace wrote Infinite Jest. Oh no. And it's so like no. cringe. <laughs> and no. it's like the first person who did that it's like, ah, oh, that's kind of funny. Like, I get it. They wrote the review, right. like, in, in the review. But, like, once you were reading some of them and, like, you read some of them, like, what made you think, like, oh, I'm going to write my own review and I'm going to write it like this. Like, we don't need half of them to be like that. Um, and what's even worse is uh, you go, if you, I went, on, I went on YouTube to listen to some, like, reviews of it, too. And, like, half the people on YouTube while they're doing it are dressed like David Foster Wallace. And for people that don't know, <laughs> David Foster Wallace is, like, has, like, this iconic purple bandana he wears. Yep, the bandana. Like, kind of, like, has, like, this weird, like, Sammy Hagar vibe. And so, like, yes. half, if you just type in, like, Infinite Jest Review and you look at the thumbnails, like, half the people are dressed like David Foster Wallace. Like, oh, this no. is awful. <laughs> um, yeah, we don't need that. Anyway, this was not a podcast about 90s literary criticism. Uh, it is instead... Actually, you know what? Before you head on, I do have... Let me just get one more thing out. Have you ever read Nicholas Baker's The Mezzanine? No, I've heard of it, though. Okay. I, I recommend you at least trying it, because it's one of my least favorite, like... Oh, what an endorsement. Uh, beloved novels. <laughs> because, like, you know, it's one of those novels where it's, like, some guy's day at the mall, and it's just him thinking about stuff, and, like, nothing really happens. But most of it is told through, like, footnotes. So, like, it'll be him thinking about stuff, and then there'll be a footnote that goes on for, like, seven pages at the bottom of the pages. And I yeah, couldn't have been more like that. If it is just, Right, because like he loves... Yeah. Yeah, he loves those, too. In fact, I don't know which one came out first. But, yeah, no, I would uh, recommend that. If you've read that through that one, it might be a good time once fresh in your head to check out The Mezzanine, because I know it was really highly regarded, but it's also a very frustrating book. Oh, that came out in 88, so I guess... If you want to blame somebody, blame Nicholas Baker. Yeah, well, what I'm seeing also from the mezzanine is that it is only 144 pages, which makes it about one-tenth the length of Infinite Jest. So. Yes, and I'd say probably like 60% of that is footnotes or endnotes. Yeah. I mean, for a work of fiction, which, you know, as an academic, that that offends me. Yeah, for, for the, I mean, the reason I read Infinite Jest was because I, I, I thought it'd be a fun challenge to read the book. <laughs> like... Um, but it ended up being like, I think I like calculated, like, I read it really fast. I read it in like two and a half weeks. Wow. Um, that's yeah. Like, and so I was, I was probably reading like three or four hours a day, which is not normal for me at all. I'm not like one of those people. Um, like it was like an insane commitment. Um, but I wanted to, it was kind of like finishing a marathon, the reason someone would run a marathon. Like I wanted to undertake this challenge. So let me read this famous book that's like apparently really difficult to read and it's really long. Um, and it was honestly like it was a waste of my time. Like I, I could have read like five books I actually liked in the, in the span of, of that time. But, um, it gave me some some podcast content, I guess, if that's what you can call what we just talked about. Um, anyway, we're really here to talk about New Japan Pro Wrestling. J. Michael follows New Japan about as close as anyone. And he's someone whose opinion I really value. Uh, and in a world where, it, you know, I feel like the last few years for New Japan, I feel like the criticism of it um, has been pretty divisive in terms of, um, I think, like, clearly the company is not in the place it was, um, like, in the, the mid to late 2010s. Right. Um for a variety of reasons. And I think people are, and this is pretty common, you could say almost the same amount of things happening in AEW too. People are kind of struggling to grasp what New Japan is now because it's different. Um, and it's, I think, kind of impacts a lot of the thoughts and criticisms people have about it. Um, in general, let's just start in general, post G1. How did you feel about the G1 as an overall tournament? Like, what would you give it as a grade? Well, so... This is where, you know, I'm glad to come on this show where it's a bit more subdued um, because I think that, like, one of the things that happened recently, you know, Rich and I talk a lot when I'm posting my stuff, probably because it's just, it takes him so long to get through my stuff, um, even though he's probably the fastest reader I've ever seen in my life. But one of the things that I was doing that he didn't want was that I kept using the Royal We 
Like I'd never used I ever. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that's just being a coward, just not wanting it to be like it's my stance on things. But yeah, the, the, the reason he told me to stop wasn't even an editorial thing. It's just that, you know, so much gets lumped in with Voices of Wrestling where it's like it's really not as much of a hive mind as you'd think. And you sort of saw that with the G1 where you had like me or John Carroll or Joel Abraham or, or, uh, or Samsa. And me and Chris talk a lot about this stuff every day. And then on the other side, you had people who were definitely down on it, which, I mean, the most prominent would be Joan Rich on the, the Voices of Wrestling podcast. So they were pretty down on it, but I stayed true the whole way through. I, I thought I would give this a solid B plus. As somebody who grades things for a living, I would say B plus. Um, beyond proficient, but sort of below exemplary on it. Um, but contextually, it's like an A plus because after the last few years of these really deflating G1s where they just tweaked with the formula too much and really just made things all fucked up um, and really unenjoyable to watch as a whole tournament. And they basically just destroyed the tournament dynamics. This one felt like a return to what it should be. Mm -hmm. And You're also- I'm just yeah. to jump in. You're talking about like the, 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 the four blocks in the various oh. like other changes that they did to the to, to the tournament, right? Yes. So like in 2022, out of nowhere, they just decided they were going to have 28 people in it, and they were going to do four blocks of seven. Which you know, as somebody who's a fencer and and is often in round robin tournaments, like pools of seven just don't work as well. You you just want a bigger pool. It doesn't feel substantial enough. And then this year, you know, like last year, they kept the four blocks, but they added more people. They sort of changed the scheduling. You know, it was a very bizarre scheduling in 2022 where it was like one match per block per night. And you need that momentum and that sort of concurrent nature of a block where they're following each other. So they fucked that up. They changed some of it last year, but I mean, it was still four blocks and it just doesn't work that way. 32 people just diluted everything to the point where, you know, some of the matches, like most nights, you could probably take about half of it off and not lose anything. Um, also, really, really stupid. Like, Samsa, if you want to piss off Chris Samsa easily, bring up the fact that they did 28 guys for G132 and then did 32 guys for G133. Um, it just, oh, he's still mad about that. <laughs> it, it's just like, what, what the fuck are you doing? Like, you know, for the symmetry. But no, I thought that this one was great. And then, you know, one of the things I was talking about before the tournament began was that it felt like the, the work was really restrained. Um, 2022 and 2023 didn't feel like we saw a lot of guys bringing that G1 intensity, guys trying to outwork their spot on the card. Um, I mean, last year, Mikey Nichols stood out for his intensity. You know, and it's like when Mikey Nichols is standing out, something's wrong. And it's probably not something natural. It felt like something that was... Uh, probably like advice or a direction that was given to the wrestlers. And what I really wanted to see was the wrestlers just sort of let loose this year. And it seemed like they did. They let the kids go. And I thought they had a good mix. And I thought they had a really interesting scheduling where, you know, there was sort of a, a weaving of narrative through the G1 where, you know, it started off with these big shows and then you had sort of the go to peak in the middle and then you sort of rounded things off nicely. So, you know, there's some format things that really frustrate me still, but all in all, I thought that this was a, a really solid and optimistic G1. Yeah, when I was during the tournament and I was, you know, seeing all, all the discussion about it, and I heard some people talk about like, you know, this is one of the best G1s ever. This has been a great tournament. And I was like, I, I, I don't agree with that. I I find that really hard to believe that people think this is one of the best G1 tournaments. But the more I think about it, I think it's probably important to think about like the context of what this tournament was relative right. to the history of the, you know, prior G1 tournaments in the sense that when I think of like, oh, the G1, like I'm thinking of like, and honestly, I can't even name any distinct years, but like, you know, 2016, 2017, 18, Those 19. Kind of, yeah, like where the, the fields, the, the the roster was just so loaded with yeah, talent. Yeah, and there's just so much great stuff. 
but that's probably also not the normal standard of the G1. If we go back and like, if I were to compare this G1 to like a G1 from like 1999 or like a G1 from like 2004. Oh, 2004. <laughs> yeah, just picking some like bleaker years. Um, that was a very just, bleak year. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, then this G1 probably is on in the upper uh, echelon. And it's fair. Like, I think that's how honestly it probably should be compared to. It shouldn't necessarily be compared to. Yeah. There's no reason why it should be compared to the state the company was in eight years ago more than 12 right. or 15 or three right um sure. so in that context i think like a b plus is like a pretty good rating um and fair grade in terms of things and i think things were accomplished in this g1 um that needed to be accomplished i'm a little there's a, there's a few things that i would have done differently but if you took this as a as a what what needed to be accomplished like in the big picture sense i think that a lot of stuff got done particularly you know getting bolton oleg um some wins mm -hmm. giving people like gabe kid more of a, a prominent role within the company in terms of sure. how they come across and kind of how they're mm -hmm. positioned in the in the roster and things like that um how, how did you feel about zach winning the tournament because he's one of you know well, he you was know, one of the favorites. I think he was an easy yeah. pick. But now that we actually saw it happen, what was kind of your thoughts on that? So one second, I'm just checking on. It's actually a stat that was in my head. Yeah, just as a, just as an idea of, I, I'm glad you brought up Gabe Kid. Uh, you know, one of the stats that I look at is card placement and sort of your booking strength, sort of the average of where you are on the card every night. And Gabe Kid was 28th out of 32 last year. And it was tied for 28th. Yeah. Whereas Which means this he's, most, year he had... he's mostly working that first match in the G1 slate. Yeah. Yep. This year he was eighth out of 20th. You know, like this is why I sort of throw this stuff out there before the tournament is I'm trying to hopefully like give people a frame to help them sort of enjoy what's going on, especially like if you were a Gabe Kid fan or you were looking for Gabe to come out a little bit harder. You know, that was like a big clue that, you know, he wasn't really in a lot of mains or semi mains. But over the course of the tournament, he was significantly higher than last year. And obviously, he completely fucking took the, the bull by the horns on that one. I mean, I don't know if anybody who raised their stock as much as him, I guess besides maybe Uemura. But as far as Zach, you know, the thing about Zach is on the Jcast, I said that he's basically the new Shibata because, you know, like it was every fucking tournament for at least like, what, five years or four or five years. Every New Japan Cup, every G1, we thought this was the one where Shibata's going to be the guy. 2012, 13, 14, 15. You know, and then he finally did it in 16. And then, you know, you know, his brain exploded. And, you know, for Zach, it was like, are they really going to do this? And I just, like, I picked it. That's what I picked. But it felt like I was sort of, like, being drawn towards something that I knew was sort of baleful and, and was not going to happen. It was just going to cause us pain. So, you know, I was at a convention center in New Jersey uh, waiting for my event to start. I was literally talking to Chris Samson as I was walking onto the strip. And like maybe five minutes earlier before that, Zach won. And I kind of was feeling like they were going to actually do it with Suji. So I was super pumped. Like, I feel like Zach was the guy. Um, and this is the time to do it, especially like with the way that people feel about him in Japan, not just that he's the only one left, but that he has put in the work, that he lives there. He's essentially fluent. Yeah, as, he, cut, you know, like, the, he as, cut the, the post-G1 promo in Japanese. Yeah, I mean, he's really, like, he's flipped the percentage on that. A lot of his backstage promos are largely Japanese. You know, his crowd addresses have become almost entirely Japanese. You know, the guys live there. He's sort of part of that contingent with, like, Chris Brooks and stuff where, he, you know, they've embraced the culture. He could have swung that flag a little bit more. Well, see, now, so here's the thing. I was super excited, and I was pumping my fist, you know, in this convention center, and I just had to finish out right there. I just had to, you know, close out, and it's like, all right, I'll watch the rest later. So then, like, I have my tournament. I go to the Voices Wrestling Slack, and I go to the Pro channel, and there's, like, 500 messages that I've missed in, like, two hours. I'm like, what the fuck is this? Usually I'm just like, all right, so what did Jeff do? 
But in this case, like I turn it on and it's like, wait, what? What what the fuck did he say? Like <sighs> Oh, yeah. So, you know, that could be a bigger question. As far as Zach winning though, aside from the aftermath of it, I, I really felt like, you know, when we're looking at the young guys, right? Suji, Shota, Uemura, Narita, even Great Okan to some degree. Like, these guys have not been back very long. I mean, Great Okan's been back for, like, what, about three and a half years. But the other guys, like, Suji just hit one year. Uh, Uemura just is under a year. Um, Narita and Shota Amino are about a year and a half. Like, as much as we want them to be forcefully pushed, it feels like those things are happening. You know, one of them won the New Japan Cup, obviously. One of them made it to the final here. I feel like, you know, it was time for Zach, right? As one final sort of thrust from his era. Because the new guys are still pretty novel. Like, I didn't feel like it was time for them. It was still time to establish them and teach the audience of what they are and what they're capable of. So, no, I thought it was Zach. I was happy for Zach. And I think he was the choice. Yeah, I only, I only brought up the flag waving thing because, like, I don't know. It's something like unique to Japanese pro wrestling, but I think they should right. adopt it in American wrestling is you get like, if you watch like the compilation, like new Japan has a great compilation of like, I think like every G one winner ever. I watched like once a year to get me hyped. Um, yeah. And just showing basically the final, like 10 seconds of, of whatever G one final. And then they show like a clip from the post-match speech and they got the big trophy, but you got the, the big new Japan G one flag, like, and Zach did not put in a full effort. I don't know. Maybe he was tired or something like that, but I did not, I didn't care for his, his little, like he gave, he, he waved it the way, like you would give like a, like a five-year-old child an American flag on a 4th of July parade. And the kids just kind of like half-heartedly waving it around. Uh, I didn't think it was. Well, I mean, you know, they had, they just had, you know, or they were about to have him defeat the purpose of the G1. So maybe he was <laughs> less enthusiastic about that. But you're right. It's like, and you know what? This gets into sort of the stuff we were talking about before where, you know, we're from New England. We're from Massachusetts. I don't know about you, but I really don't follow college sports that, that much. No, it's not. I, I mean, obviously, I know, here. I know, I guess you kind of have to in your job a bit, but, you know, we, we have pro sports here. We have, like, we don't have to deal with college sports here. I know BC, but, we don't deal with that nonsense, maybe hockey a bit or a lot, you know, but like, that is one thing that I think you're right about. I miss that. Like, we don't see that enough in pro sports with like athletes, like waving flags, like they do in college or in Japan. Like there's something, there's something really grandiose about like that flag. If I was, if I was Tony Khan and I was like running AEW, like from a production perspective, I would have wrestlers waving flags. I would have like, yeah the old like Japanese style, like banner flags that they would have like in the entrance way for big matches and stuff like that. Yes. Those are so yeah. eye catching and they stand out. And I just don't know if, like why you wouldn't do that from an aesthetic perspective. Like when you watch, like you've seen the famous, I'm sure you've seen the famous like Onita entrance um, for his match uh, where he's just getting like mega, mega heat and he like puts on the chair and he smokes a cigarette and like, and they have all those, like the old, like, I don't know, they look like like the old like samurai movie banner like there's probably an official name for them that i'm don't know but like they have all those sticking out of the fan the, the the entrance way like hanging over um the ramp and stuff like that i was like this is so cool it looks nothing like anything else you would see like certainly in american wrestling um no but for for me zach like i i really like zach um i think he is uh he's probably become i think like an underrated worker just in terms of like is this guy like an all-time great worker does he deserve to be in the wrestling observer newsletter hall of fame based on the strength of his work that kind of level of, a, of an in-ring wrestler i did think heading into the final match that like, between yoda suji and zach um and i guess if you were to ask me like who was i rooting for i was root i guess i was rooting for zach um But I do think the conventional smart booking would have been to put Suji over. Um, I feel like in the long run, that's the move that you would want to make if you were a booker, would be let's get this guy. And you make a good point. He's only been back for a year, which when you said that, I was like, no, he's been back for two years. But then I looked it up and it's like he came back June 2023. Yeah. Um, 
and he's it's because you know when he came back he kind of got immediately thrust into a pretty prominent role as opposed oh to guys God. like guys like Uminu and Yui Mora who kind of like you know were put like kind of in the mid card and were kind of put on like a like maybe a, like a longer track uh mm-hmm. to, to start them but to me it was like realistically it's like do you want to push this older guy who's been around for a while I don't know, more likely to have hit his ceiling um or do you want to put this this new homegrown native star when you really need i think like a top level native star um sure and they went with with zach instead um which i'm not upset about at all but i was thinking like just from a booking perspective um i felt like there was a ch- it was a chance to do something with yoda um they didn't sure. um there's always, you know, you can argue uh, that, well, they'll, you know, this, it's not Yoda's time. It'll be Yoda's time in the future. There's, you know, he's only been back a year. There's plenty of time to get to him, um, which they're pro- you're probably right about that, but it's not always the case. Stuff happens. Guys lose momentum. Um, what happened to Uemura? Yeah. Um, I, mean, that, yeah. I mean, yeah, that, I mean, that was a big one. Or even like, you know, it's wrestling is is all about one of Dave Meltzer's critical booking thoughts. Um, is wrestling is about time and place, um, and I don't know if you have like just infinite chances with Suji to push him up a level. I think they maybe had a chance right when he came back. They decided not to do it then, which okay, that makes sense. Like, let's you know you're, you know we're not going to push him immediately as soon as he gets back. Although that's what they did with Kazushiko Okada, and I think that worked out pretty well. Sure. Um, but and then okay, so you had another chance here with this G1 where I thought, you know, leading up to it with especially coming off of his the end of his G1, he had the match with David Finley. Like it, I felt like he had been picking up momentum. You could hear it in the building. Um that that the like the fans are really starting to get behind him. And it's like, okay, if he goes on and wins the G1, that's like a huge emphatic statement. Um right. you know, and, and goes on to the G1 and then presumably goes on to main event at the Tokyo Dome. Um you would think like that's yeah one, one would think i don't know why one would think that but um <laughs> but like that to me is like a really emphatic statement about this is a guy that we're really getting behind we're recognizing that he's got some momentum i i'm a i'm a huge believer in suji i think he has the talent to get there um mm-hmm. and they opted not to do that um and they went with zach and and like i said i really like zach like from a from i think from like a personal fan perspective i was rooting for zach for a lot of the same reasons you laid out he had gotten close before um he had been building momentum he's definitely more over than he's ever been before in japan so it's not like it's a terrible decision or anything like that but i do feel like it was it was a chance to push suji and they opted not to do that um or push suji all the way into this hugely prominent spot um and they chose not to do that and i thought that was potentially a mistake yeah i mean like when i say zach's the choice i think suji uh, i wouldn't have any problems with suji either just from an objective standpoint you know, you do wonder, like, we're constantly getting this headcanon, which is very convincing in our own heads, about, like, this is the year that they do all the LIJ stuff. And that's kind of how I convinced myself that Suji was going to win. It's like, all right, we're going to, we're, we're time to do it. We're going to have all LIJ final. Seems like they're the ones that draw the most anyway, so we might as well. And then, you know, just seeing how this tournament played out. Um, I mean, Ren and Rita sucks. And showed the Umino is an absolute disaster um, on screen and off. So, you know, Uemura, though, I thought had the best tournament out of any of them, at least through the, the league. And I thought that was a big, big, big thing for him to show and make that leap, because I do truly believe he's the chosen one. But Suji is a really great fixed point. And I thought they were creating a fixed point, right? So that there's one guy that this generation is sort of now base themselves off of, right? That, that they're reflected off of him. And then it's either like, ooh, Amura goes to get that spot or whatever. But like mm-hmm. one of them needs to get there first for the other ones to then have a response, right? So from that standpoint, it might be a missed opportunity, but, you know, it also depends on what they were trying to do. I mean, if they value the fall so goddamn much now, who knows what they would have done with Suji? I mean, if, if Suji won and they did this, it would have been an absolute disgrace. I mean, it still is, but yeah, I mean, I, I, even though I said that Zach's the guy, but I still agree with all what you said, too. It's like, 
go all in with one guy, and I think we've seen that at least one of these young guys is capable of matching that, you know, which is one of the biggest pushes I think we've ever seen. I mean, the Dominion main event is the number two spot of the year, and he went there like his very first match. Not even mm -hmm. any warm up tags, first yeah, match. That, that's why I point is like that was a chance to really, really go like, okay, we're just totally pushing this guy and we're starting, we're ripping right. up. We're, this is a brand new chapter of New Japan for wrestling. Yeah. And he still, yeah. in a lot of ways, got that opportunity by just by simply by being in that match. But sure. Yeah. And you could say, well, the same I mean, it's also, team. well, it's like, if that's what you were going to do with Sonata after that match, right? Some dopey match with the Jungle Boy and then, you know, his fall is going to be eaten up by evil in a match that didn't draw. I mean, could have done worse, but, you know, it also sort of plays into something that I think too, which is like, I, I do want them to push guys harder out the gate. I mean, I kind of think they need to run guys through the system a bit quicker because we're seeing certainly like in DDT, at least as far as the other program I watch, DDT is pushing guys through really fast, and they're getting very good. All Japan is as well. I, that's right. I've seen that too. So it's like they're pushing these guys, and it's like you have a couple rough years, and then they make a leap. I, I don't know how DDT keeps finding these guys, but you know, like New Japan just is so laborious and arduous about what they do, and it's just glacial. And you know, but while Suji comes back and he's thirty, Uemura too. You know, and the problem there is, you know, like I like them working with the time frame that they are. It feels like this is a a sensible way to push them bit by bit. But it kind of comes back to something that you said before. I think our brains have been poisoned by the Rainmaker shock. Like everything, every debut or re-debut is sort of compared to that. So that if somebody doesn't, it sort of even feels lesser if they don't do something magnanimous, like, right when they come back. And, I don't know, maybe this is a chance to, like, sort of get away from that since Okada isn't there, but... I mean, when even though he didn't win the title, I mean, Suji's been pushed really fucking hard. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're right. It could have been a chance to just sort of set that point that this is where we're at, and even if it's not going to draw off the dome to crazy levels, we're going to go with it. And they didn't. How do you feel about the consistent kind of G1? And I and there's obviously a huge reason why they would do this because it keep, makes the tournament very interesting heading into the final few days. Um, in terms of really like kind of a lot of like 50-50 booking within the sense of the G1 tournament in terms of making sure that the blocks are super competitive, there's a bunch of guys mm -hmm. trying to stay alive as opposed to the flip side of like, they could have done this with a guy like Suji. They could have done it with anybody, but I'll use Suji as an example. It's just like, what if Suji just won all his matches in the G1? And like you I'm really cool. yep. went super hard with establishing this guy as um, ahead of the rest of his peers. Because I do think that that is somewhat of, a, of an issue where you have a lot of guys, like for me, New Japan is like, you have, you have Naito who's kind of in his own tier in terms of like popularity and star power and things like that. And then you have this massive second tier of guys right. of various stages of their careers who can all beat each other. They can lose at any time. And it's interesting from like a perspective of like, who are they going to pick? Who is going to break out from this gigantic second tier? But right. I feel like you really, they New Japan at this point, having, you know, lost some guys that I think were in that one, number one tier with Naito, mm -hmm. um, whether that's someone like Tanahashi, who's, you know, had a face down to a different part of his career, or people like Okada and Osprey, um, who went to AEW. Th there's someone you need to, to, to break somebody out. And I do feel like, you know, you could say you did that a little bit with Suji, you could say that you did it with Zach, but it still feels like, like there's an opportunity to really establish someone at a level above their peers which is sure. in any wrestling company critical to making them come across like a star i think mm -hmm. um and instead you know the g1's the last few years particularly has been really focused seem like on like let's try to keep as many people alive in the tournament as possible heading into the final few nights which has tons yeah. of logic and i'm not going to dispute that that's not an effective way to book a g1 because it clearly is but i do think there's an opportunity that maybe they're missing in terms of 
Like, we, let's just like get the whole machine behind some guy, which to create a new star. Um, and I feel like, you know, as much as I um, have numerous, 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 numerous problems with WWE and their booking, yeah, one thing that I do think that they do effectively is to, like if they decide someone's going to get a mega push, mm-hmm. they push the absolute shit out of that guy. Actually, um, can I talk about that for a second? Because I'm yeah. glad you brought that up. Now, I'm so I don't watch WWE, and I find them repugnant, even without you uh, know. This is a safe space for you face. to say that. Good, good. Without you know, fuck face. Like you're talking about like literary figures. Like these new pictures of Vince. It's like, boy, he's leaning into the Irish thing hard. He's trying to be fucking James Joyce out there. And so, uh, well, if you've read James Joyce's letters, you'd know that there's probably a lot more similarities between the two than you'd like to admit. Yeah. But. I mean, David Foster, WWE, David Foster Wallace could have been a writer for the Attitude Era. Imagine like the big board and the year-to-year narratives, man. Yeah, there's a the, lot of cross-dressing humor in Infinite Jest, like a lot. Oh Jesus Christ! I was going to say, like, can you imagine the promos he'd write for these people. Oh, God Almighty! So, <laughs> okay, this is like Vince WWE. Russo, David Foster Wallace collaboration in my head. Can you imagine? Now. Well, the first and, time anyone's thought of that ever. It wouldn't be the weirdest thing, right? Because like. Anybody who's a big, like, indie snob fuckface, like, the fact that Bob Mould from fucking Husker Du ended up being a writer for, like, sinking ship WCW is probably one of the weirdest things in wrestling when you really think about it. David Foster Wallace and his, his purple bandana and Vince Russo in his New Jersey Devils jersey, like, going over a run sheet for 1999 WCW. I don't know. They're both bros, though. They would, I think I know. it would work. Yeah. But uh, WWE... I got, you know, I, I'm glad because I do think they do deserve credit because, like, what I think, like, in a lot of ways, I was just thinking about this. It popped up on uh, John's show. WWE sort of rebuilt themselves in the New Japan peak sort of tropes and motifs because what made them strong again? Like, since the pandemic, they booked their champion strong, right? Long title reigns, strong title reigns you know, trying to, like, have champions win where you think they'll lose. And not just Roman. Like, Drew McIntyre's had a number of those runs. Bobby Lashley was very strong. Like, I think that is really, like, if you're thinking about wrestling promotion, that's where you have to start. The champions need to be strong. And to do that, they need to have substantial title reigns, which is an interesting contrast to New Japan, who've had about 35 title changes, I think, already this year. Um, And multiple ones at the top, unfortunately in both the junior and heavyweight division. And then the other thing that they did, you know, thinking about like some of these guys you're talking about, like I keep coming back to Suzuki Goon and how like how improbable it was that Suzuki Goon made themselves baby faces. And it's sort of like Gabe as well, where like if there's an endearingness and especially if you see people in factions being sort of like, like legitimate camaraderie, right? Like, you could tell that suzuki Goon, even though they were so nefarious, they liked being around each other, and there was sort of, like, this camaraderie between them. And I think that's what babyfaced them. And you sort of saw that when they injected Sami Zayn into the bloodline, which was really just, like, as stagnant as possible. And then look what they've done in the last two years or two and a half years since they made that decision. But when I look at that, I'm like, that's what New Japan was doing five or six years ago. And they're not right now. So I was thinking about this in I maybe this is like me like remembering like the Halcyon days of like peak New Japan. But to me, one of the obvious things about New Japan in the mid 2000s was that or mid 2010s was that not the mid 2000s. Not, definitely not the mid 2000s. Uh no, oh, the, mid, the mid 2010s. Ask me about 2004. Yeah, the mid just How do you feel about Bob Sapp's IWGP World Heavyweight Champion reign? Um the uh How but do I feel mid- about Brock Lesnar's? Yeah. <laughs> in the mid 2010s um was like a really obvious hierarchy of top guys you had tanahashi okada and then it kind of varied it's i think it started with nakamura and then when nakamura left naito really and naito came back from mexico um Mm -hmm. he really stepped into that role and then kind of whoever was the leader of the bullet club um, you know, it could have been, a, it was AJ Styles, then it was Kenny Omega, right. and then it was Jay White. Um, but they kind of had like four guys, and those guys were like 
relative equals in terms of being protected, but they were like clearly better than everybody else at yes. wrestling in New Japan. Like they won the most matches. They some combination of them main evented the Tokyo Dome and won the G1. Like and they were seemingly. faction leaders. Yeah, they led their own factions, like, or if you in Tanahashi's case, he you know led his own like group of yeah, unaffiliated baby everything. faces. Yeah. Which in, in its own sense ended up being its own faction. Um, which it should be. That, that's a big thing too. I think Hantai being so weak and so nebulous yeah. is a problem. Yeah. Um and it felt like that was just like a really core established and it and it worked. And like I said, when I was talking about the tiers now, where it's like Naito is in his own tier, um, kind of as like the last guy from that era of New Japan that's still around and still healthy, question mark. Um, yeah. And no. then you have, um, yeah, the answer is no, but, uh, <laughs> um, but you know, he's the world champion. He's the big, he's, he's, I think, undisputably the biggest star in the company still. Oh. Easily, um, easily, he, easily, you know, was main eventing pretty much every night he was in the G1. It felt like, you know, yep. uh, it, it seems like he has to be the main event of the Tokyo Dome. Maybe not. We'll yeah, see I, whatever right. that happens, but it would seem like he would have to be in it just from a star power perspective. Um, but then you have kind of everyone else and you don't have that hierarchy and you have this kind of big blob of guys. And it's not like there's a shortage of talents. Um, right. No. that of guys that you could choose to break out and put in those positions um the other thing that's related to that and you kind of already mentioned when you talked about like the establish reestablishing you know wwe reestablishing their top guys with these long title reigns and things like that the other thing is and, and again maybe the nostalgia is clouding this a little bit maybe it wasn't really like this um back then but mm -hmm. like basically like four or five guys held the world title for like a 10-year span in new japan it was like much, Tanahashi, yeah. Okada, AJ Styles, Naito, Omega. That was like That's the, it. that was like it for like you know a five or six year run at least. Mm -hmm. Um and it made it seem like if someone won the I like when Omega finally won the IWGP world title, or when Naito finally won it. Not only was it cool that they finally won the world title, but it also felt like a really strong message of this guy is now established into this absolute elite tier of guys, and he's going to be super prominent and super important for basically as long as he continues to wrestle. Um, yeah. And now, because they've passed, they've, they've done all sorts of stuff for the world title, including renaming it and things like that. Renaming it, new yeah. lineage, yeah. Yeah. But they've kind of passed the title around to a lot of different guys in the roster. Yeah. And... Um, and now it's almost like you, it, it doesn't feel like it's, even though holding the world title is still really important, it means you're main eventing big shows. It means the company has to, is trying to believe in you from a business perspective. It just feels like if you win the world title now, you're not necessarily joining a elite group because you're joining a group that also contains evil and Sonata and Shingo and these guys that they really have kind of, in some ways, like given up on pushing to the top. Yeah, and, uh, and unfortunately, there's one more name to add to that. I mean, the, and, and probably a reason why we're here right now. And again, like, I, my ultimate message today is going to be very positive, but there's some really nitpicky things as we're in this sort of, I mean, it's an awkward transitional period where they're also, like, amplifying how awkward it is by making some weird decisions. And putting the title belt on Moxley this year was a very weird mm -hmm. decision that they made even worse with how they treated it and the title defenses he had. You know, I, yeah, it all starts at the top, doesn't it? Right. And, and it's just like it to me, it has kind of taken some of this. Like, I guess, I guess all I'm asking for is here is more protective booking. Sure. Well, and also, you know, like this is, it really is like from the very beginning, people were saying it was a cursed title because obviously, like, Abushi made this new title. Um, and I was really hoping Despy won, actually, but Abushi kept going. And that he's another one, by the way, that they lost as a top tier guy. Mm -hmm. Not, you know, not, but not. Yeah, like, like yeah. Planned, it's, but... it's, it, well, it's important. It's important to reference in like in the context, like, and we talk when we talk about like the, if we want to bring up like the G one attendance figure, like comparing it year over I year, will. And the state of the company, like for like the company has lost a ton of top tier talent. 
Um, and yeah. a lot of it is kind of through no fault of their own. So, um, you know, like it's, it, it, I can't blame Gato for any of that for the most part. Sure. Um, well, I mean, look at what happened. Like Abushi wins the title or he wins the title, win the title, won the title. Mm -hmm. And then he, you know, obviously they forced him into doing this with like these hostage videos he had to do backstage explaining this. And like Abushi doesn't know how to explain things anyway. So having him explain like what ended up being a very complicated and convoluted way to, to restate the title and all this. Mm -hmm. Then you had Naito at the same time saying like he was going to do whatever he could to stop it. But he didn't even really understand why he was stopping it. Like that was a very strange feud. Yeah. I also but just then, don't like... care. Like I don't care that like, I don't know, maybe this is <laughs> me being like a Western fan or whatever, but like, I don't really care. Like Naito is, is going to stop Ibushi from merging these titles. Like, like who cares? Oh Yeah. Well, and also it's like, you know, you set you like you took the Intercontinental title and you like basically merged them, but you didn't merge yeah. them and it's like, you know, which they've never been able to replace the Intercontinental Championship by the way in terms of like how important it feel felt. Well, and I, you know, I'm about to talk about things that were outside of their control somewhat, but we mm -hmm. can talk about things that were within their control. For instance, you have David Finley, who by the way was my number 2 guy in this tournament by ratings like there's a lot of talk about David Finley, but I think he's been very good. But even aside how you think about his matches, like he's the leader of a faction. He's inherited the Bullet Club lineage and he's inherited the sort of Gato's my manager lineage. He beats Osprey and Moxley at Wrestle Kingdom. He has this like really unprecedented cage match to send Osprey off in a very big moment in Osaka. And then he loses to Dolph Ziggler, loses this title that you just established two months before. You know, like that's how you, you lose track of things and how people stop taking things seriously. Yeah, that that sadly sounds like a, like a bad TNA series of events. Like oh, guy gets huge yeah. win and then loses yep. to Nick Nemeth coming back from WWE, and, coming over from WWE. Yeah, and look, yeah, look who they were back into bed with before TNA decided to get into bed with the other one. Yeah. So all right, so Ibushi wins the title, then he loses it to Osprey. Osprey's neck's all fucked up, so he has to vacate. Um, and then, like, you know, Okada finally wins it at Wrestle Kingdom, and then he loses it to Jay White, and the Jay White title reign was, like, an absentee title reign. He was never around. Okada wins it back, and then loses it to Sonata, which started well, but it's like, you look at the title reign in, you know, like, totality, and it's like, why couldn't we just have kept it on Okada the whole year? I mean, obviously, yeah. like, maybe what? they had inkling of what he was going to do, but yeah. I mean, by I mean, all accounts, they didn't. Yeah. I mean, I didn't, I mean, I don't, I'm pretty, I'm pretty down on Sonata overall, but like, I will defend like the attempt with Sonata. Sure. Like they had, you know, they wanted to, they, they had to make a decision with this guy. They kicked the tires on him. I don't think he delivered at the way they wanted him to. Um, and that's that, but you had, you, you only get, you only, you only get somewhere if you try. So I had sure. no problem with what they did with that. Well, my problem was, was, and honestly, I think when you really look back on the title reign, it's the fall. It's the fall that just sort of poisons your memories. Because, like, he had a good G1. Like, he was the champion fighting all the new guys. And that was kind of a cool block. It was the best block last year. And, like, the Suji match was really cool. But then, like, he got bogged down in evil. And it was a really stupid program with a really stupid payoff. And, like, it was, you know, a House of Torture match that didn't work. And when it doesn't work, it's rough. And, unfortunately, that guy sort of you know, his title reign sort of soiled because of it. And, and that's, you know, to my point, like you got, now you've got all these guys. It feels kind of like a little bit like WWE, like over the last like 10 years, where it just seemed like anyone that kind of got a little bit of momentum in the mid card eventually got a world title run. Mainly because they, you know, they had two titles. They wanted to change things around. They pushed guys briefly and then gave up on them. Whether that's like Jinder Mahal or Jack Swagger or whoever, it just seems like kind of like you devalued the lineage of your title. Everyone kind of felt like they could win the title at any time. Um, and I mean, New Japan's not quite like that, but it just it seems like you. St it felt like you had this real prestige with the the championship. And you can go throughout IWGP history. We mentioned like people like Bob Sapp and Brock Lesnar. Like it's not like the person. It's always been super prestigious to hold the world title. But I feel like it's just been passed around by a lot of got a lot lately. That it doesn't mean sure. as much as it could. And part of that was 
trying to push new guys by giving them the world title, like, which is good, but it, I don't know, maybe they picked the wrong guys. Yeah, it's um, weird. I mean, because, like, if you look at it on paper, like, this is a very star stout group of people, right? It's like, it's Ibushi, Osprey, Shingo, Okada, Jay White. Even if you want to say, like, Sonata being sort of the outlier, you know, I think it's just a lot of circumstances working against them, right? Like, you can just basically write off the pandemic as it's just inherently, mm -hmm. like, a, as insolvent. But, like, I remember when Jay, even during the pandemic, when Jay White won that title, and it was another one where I thought Okada just should have kept going, but, like, Jay White won the title at Dominion, and it was like, there was a, a real energy about that, but, you know, you couldn't get him into Japan for whatever reason. I don't know the reason, it's just he just wasn't there, you know? So it's like, sometimes the decision-making seems solid at first, and then it just sort of went awry. You know, it just seems like they're a cursed company and they're a confused company with a lot of things set up to be great soon. But, you know, right now we're sort of in that awkward moment. So. Oh, and actually, can I come back to one thing you said? I forgot to actually answer sure. one of your questions about, um, you know, like the, the parody booking. Um, yeah. Because, you know, some people like they, they prefer that. And then I say it's like, I think it's just a case by case. Because obviously, like, you're going to get that. I, you know, as somebody who's a big proponent of the one match final, and I hate the playoff, I think the playoffs sort of feed into that, honestly, especially like this year, where you have three people advancing. Um, and the final night scenarios were really frustrating to work out. But like, you look out some of these past G1s, right? Like the 2019 G1, everybody would say is an incredible G1, like an A plus G1, right? And the A block... The final night, it was Ibushi and Okada, and that was it. Nobody else was alive. And you think about Osprey, Tanahashi, Saber, even Kenta in that tour. Like these are things that you fondly remember as a really great G one. But at the end, it was really just down to two guys. Even when you think about a few years ago, when Dave, or Jeff Cobb and, and Okada beat everybody, right? And it was like, could Jeff Cobb go nine and zero? And he didn't, but. Like, that was exciting, too. You know, I think it, it's inevitable, the parody booking. I think they usually balance it well with, like, one block where people emerge and one block where it's sort of a big mess. Mm -hmm. You know, the problem this year, I think it's, like, a lot of things amalgamating. For instance, you look at the final results and you're like, where are the faction leaders? Like, you have Zack Sabre Jr. and David Finley won their block, and they are faction leaders. But then it's like Evil came in fourth. Sonata came in seventh. We don't even, like, we don't have a leader of Chaos. We don't have a leader of United Empire. You know, there's just so much things that are sort of amorphous. And I, I do agree with you that, like, I think they're slowly sort of working their way towards the hierarchy, especially as the young guys sort of, like, you know, Uemura and Suji sort of thrown into factions. You know, Omino's trying to take over Hantai, but nobody's taking him seriously right now. And Narita got tossed in the house of torture, and it's like, I think we're at that place where, like, we're sort of building it up, but I don't think you can wait too long. I think, you know, within the next few years, those guys need to be leading factions. Especially if you still are going to go with the Three Musketeers thing. Like, they need to be very clear delineations about who's at the top of these factions. Because that is, like, you know, if you want to know... To give away Chris's secrets, how does Chris Samson predict things so well? He just kind of chooses the faction leaders because that's how they've always booked. And I think it's like it's a testament to sort of how things are a bit confused right now that it's not even that they, they don't even know who to choose because they don't have that clear like delineation right now. Yeah, well, the thing with the playoffs is, like, if you're going to have two people advance from the block, you can get away with, like, having someone just blitz through the tournament and still have some drama because there's that second spot that's still available. Right. Um, so I was saying, like, one of the reasons maybe they don't want to just, you know, have someone go undefeated and, and kill everyone is because they want to have, like, as many, like, they want to have drama at the end of the night. They don't want to have, like, this lame duck final day. Um, but with the right. second spot in the tournament, you can do that. Um, 
because you yeah one of the spots is locked up but you can have all these people trying to get in for that that last wild card spot like you would you know if you were to watch like baseball or or football or anything like that like you know sometimes the division is out of reach but all these teams are still alive trying to clinch up a spot in the wild card spot you can still right. book like that um but yeah i mean i think like time and time again i think it just comes down to like um wanting some more protective booking um to elevate some guys um is ultimately all i'm focused on and uh well and, and that's what i always say it's yeah. like the strongest thing you can do like i feel like a g1 block winner should be a big deal winning your block and it hasn't been the last few years even when they did you know single advance with four blocks he's still in a playoff i just i miss that immediacy between a block final b block final final like that three night run wherever budokan rio goku whatever and i feel like like that's a good way to just like say these are guys like the only one person emerges and this is the person that emerged but it could be that they just don't feel ready to do that yet with who they've got but it's We're sort of like wrestle kingdom because i thought joe had a good point on the on the voices of wrestling show where it's like it seems like they don't trust the roster and like i don't blame the roster for that i think that's on them like they've got to trust these guys and even like you know it's a weekend january 4th show so it kind of annoys me that they don't have a stronger vision or they're not going to present a strong vision of what that should be because mm -hmm. like a you know a weekday wrestle kingdom who cares you're, you're, there's only so much you're going to do or draw you know this is a saturday you know january 4th and we're going into it in a very sort of complex and labyrinthine way i don't know it just feels like they're 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 a bit meek right now yeah when i well, really let's, wish let's... they'd be a bit stronger let's cut to the chase like Zack Sabre Jr. is breaking tradition, not taking his G1 title shot at the Tokyo Dome. He's wrestling at Kings of Pro Wrestling um, in October. Uh, what was your like takeaway from that? Uh, it's fucking stupid. Um, yeah. There's just no other like, you know, there's no fancy way to put it. It's just like, you know, I can, I understand where the people who like it and all that. And I can understand like, you know, the falls were boring and whatever. But to me, it's like, who gives a fuck about the fall? Right? Like, who gives a fuck? Like, Wrestle Kingdom's the point. You know, and that's on them. Like, they could find ways to do it. I think the briefcase was more trouble than it was worth, honestly. Like, I yeah, think connecting... I, I, didn't, I didn't like that gimmick, yeah. the briefcase. I didn't like the, the you know, random title defense of the G1 shot. Like, you win the whole G1 tournament, and now you've got to win another match. Uh, well, also, you guy. know, the thing that I always thought about that, and we saw it with the Jay White thing, which, you know, they tried to tell like a four month story in a two month span because of the pandemic and they didn't adjust. But like winning the G1 to me is on par with like any other championship they've got, mm -hmm. you know, besides the main one. Well, like, and to me, like, like what's... making that something that you can defend, like, why, why is that something you can defend? I think it inherently devalues it. How can you defend it? Like it, it's a tournament that they won. Like, like making it that to me was a problem. And by getting rid of it a couple of years ago with Okada, like I thought you solved the problem. It's just we know these two people are going to face each other in a few months, and whatever happens along the way is not going to change that. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean it's you're right about like it's like, um, you know, like why would you defend like the like the Chiefs won the Super Bowl like last year, but like they lost to the Raiders. So like, would they like it'd be like after the Super Bowl? All right, you gotta def you gotta fight the Ra you gotta play the Raiders to for, right. to defend your Super Bowl win. Otherwise, the Raiders win the Super Bowl. Like and and the, um, yeah, the reason why they never did it when we you know besides the pandemic, but like you know that was a clear story that they just didn't have time to tell. The reason why you don't do it and have somebody like win the title shot and then go it's because like is the crowd really supposed to get behind that person like they didn't actually win the g1 yeah so they and, don't have the credibility or the authenticity to challenge for the title it just feels cheap and, and at this point what's the biggest accomplishment a wrestler in new japan can have uh, winning that title i guess or winning the g1. i was say, i was a main eventing wrestling oh main event yeah, yeah yeah right that's like the biggest accomplishment you can win the world title and not do that Actually, you're right, because most of the time people, like the first, I think it was, what, six years that they had the, the briefcase, you know, the challenger lost. Mm -hmm. And that was yeah, like, like their peak peak years, too. 
But like, so Zach wins the G1. What does that say other than Zach, you know, gets his name etched in history as a G1 winner and things like that? What does it really say? It's like, okay, that not only does Zach have won the G1, you have this, if you have this big Zach Sabre Jr. supporter that's been following him for a long time, mm-hmm. not only does it say that he won the G1, but now it's like, oh, now they, you know, he's going to get this opportunity. He's going to main event Wrestle Kingdom, like, which is just a hugely prestigious opportunity. Um, and then he's like, actually, you know, I think I'm gonna rest. Uh, I like sumo, sumo Hall. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, <laughs> like you know, Hall. yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrestle in October. And it's like, oh wow. So like, what does that say? Does that say that they don't have faith in Zach to main event Wrestle Kingdom, um, or they have some big storyline? Like when he said that, my thought was, they're gonna have an outsider come in and main event Wrestle Kingdom. <laughs> well, if it's not Takeshita, then I'm not interested. Well, yeah, I mean, and it could be because they're doing the joint AEW show the next day. It could literally be like anyone. It could be Osprey. That's... It could be Okada. It right. could be Omega. It could be one of those people. Which, yeah, I mean, um... I think that just shows like this is a very desperate company right now. Obviously, with mm-hmm. there's a lot going on in Japan, but like just the way that they're booking stuff, and then obviously with this. You know, it, it's like we're not totally out of the pandemic, right? Like in the pandemic, they did what they had to do, right? So they booked Cork and Hall like 20 times a month and aired every single one of them. Yeah. Right. They did all of it. Like they're, they're just going to run dome after dome because at the very least they can have higher capacities there. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, we're going to sacrifice Wrestle Kingdom because at the very least, maybe the AEW thing will get us more stuff and just trying to make our way through this, you know, and, and, you know, it's, I understand it. I get it. It sucks, but you know, I, I, that's, I think where they're coming from with it. You know, the problem here is just like, there's no way to look at this that justifies what Zach does. Like obviously from a, you know, smart, annoying perspective of just knowing everything and being a know-it-all. It's like, this is a clear sign that either they don't trust him or they, they just don't have faith that he could do it there. Or they're just like, in some sort of crisis and they're like, we can't sacrifice a fall. But then from a kayfabe perspective, it's like, I mean, if you're just looking at this as like, you know, from just a fan's perspective and not thinking about the, the, the hidden hand of the booker, wouldn't you be pissed off? You're like, you just won the G1 and I've been expecting you. And it's not going to be like, Oh boy, Oh boy. I get to see it three months early. It's like the fuck. I wanted to see you face Naito at the, the, the Tokyo dome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's like, and it's like, what's the statement you're telling your fans? Like, the prestige of main eventing Wrestle Kingdom is like an enormous, enormous accomplishment. I guess, like, right. I'm saying that, like, from my personal fan perspective. And it's like, that really means something. And part of the excitement of winning the G1 is not only is are you winning the G1 and you get the trophy and you can wave the flag, but you are then going to get this incredible opportunity to, to, to main event this prestigious show um, in a, in a position that I feel like still has some prestige to it. Um, and now it's, it's, he, it's not going to happen now. Right. Well, we think it's not going to happen. Like I, I, I when Maybe, I saw yeah. it, I was like, okay, well it feels if it's not, if it's cause it's not going to be, let's say Zach isn't going to be the main event of wrestling kingdom. Who, who is going to be the main event? What's going to be in the main event of Wrestle Kingdom? It's probably going to be Naito. Yeah, it's got to be. Would, but who would he be wrestling? Is he going to be wrestling someone else on this that was like in the G1 that's on this New Japan roster? Like, who would that I be? Mean, and why wouldn't you just have that person right. win the G1 in the first place? Well, I guess unless want... it's Hiromu, but I'm not. Yeah, I guess you know, that's I, I see where people are coming from, but I'm not really compelled by that match. And to be honest with you, I'm not so sure that the crowds would be compelled by that either right now you know like they've got a lot of work to do to make Hiromu who's pretty cold kind of been on the shelf for a while maybe just having it will make people excited but I don't know yeah. as, as a Tokyo Dome main event that, that feels like a like a sumo hall sort of deal you know yeah, what I mean? maybe they could they maybe they could do that at Kings of Pro Wrestling instead <laughs> <laughs> yeah um yeah well I mean yeah I mean that's the point then so that's why my mind immediately went to outsider um which yeah. feels like, like I don't know. Pick your AEW guy. I, I mean, I, I personally, I would think that I think it'd be pretty cool. 
but at the same time, it seems like a short term decision. Like we just got to try to get attention on us now, as opposed right. to like whether it was Zach or if you went with Suji, it would be like, here's a statement about the direction of our company and how we're headed into the future. Um, as opposed to, we just got to like, you said, we're kind of still in the pandemic mode where it's like, we just got to grab whatever we can right now to survive, um, which right. is not a, historically speaking, not a healthy way to book a wrestling company. Um, no. And I mean, I mean, I hope it works. I mean, I, I think they have the pieces set up for sure, especially after this G1 that if they, if they're feeling like they just have to tread water, you know, we've got so much that you can run with, for a very long time afterwards it's just at a certain point we have to stop trying to tread water and just make that transition mm -hmm. we're gonna play a game it's gonna work i'm gonna try to do this as quickly as humanly possible um okay. but we're gonna play a, a quick game it's gonna be called very simple stock up stock down I'm gonna give you a name you tell me if you think their stock went up in the g1 their stock went down in the g1 i guess i'll offer the opportunity you can say stock stayed the same um okay. But you just tell me what you think, and maybe we'll talk about like one or two sentences about each of them. Um, but we'll start. Um, Oleg Bolton. Oh my God! Stock through the fucking roof. Yeah, that's an easy one, right? Yeah, yeah. Put yeah. the title on him. Put the title on him, January fourth. Fuck it. Yeah, that he, he's, a message. he's got. He's yeah. I mean, he's he's got a he's natural, and he has this real sense of physicality that. Oh, and like a, a physique, like that physique that you don't really see there. Yeah, I mean, he's just, he's a big boy. Um, Red Narita. Apparently he didn't, he, oh, so, and he, apparently he didn't know what wrestling was until he got to New Japan, however many years ago, to be in their, you know, amateur wrestling system. So he, he might just like be a, a prodigy, honestly. He wouldn't be the first guy, you know, he wouldn't be the first guy like that. No, no, no. Uh, Red Narita. Well, this is where it's tricky because I think, like in kayfabe terms, it's probably stock up a bit. But I mean, you know, we're not evaluating this totally yeah. that way. And I'm going to say stock down. I mean, he just he's he sucks. He's he's a he's a fraction of what he was before he came back. I just we don't need another interference laden heel. He's not good at it. Japan. I hate you know, House like, of, I, I mean, I know this, I don't know, this might come across <laughs> as controversial, somebody. I hate House of Torture. I hate how predictable almost all the matches are. I think it's every one of their finishes is like super duper uncreative. I can't believe people defend it. I, I just, it's so bad. It's not what I want in wrestling at all. It's not what I want in New <laughs> Japan specifically. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. I want them to all go away. People talk about, you know, Tanahashi, like, you know, gives these press conferences and he talks about how, you know, he wants to kind of clean up the company to have less interference. And people talk yeah, about it. Like, well, people talk about it like wrestling is real. Like they'll talk about like, oh, you can see Tanahashi starting to make a difference because there's a little less, you know, interference in this match. And I'm like, how about we just get yeah. rid of it entirely? How, can we can we do that? I know that might be unpopular. I know some <laughs> people will be like, oh, that's a crucial part of Ghetto's booking is he always has interference. But no, let's get rid of it because it's been going on for a decade. I, I don't guess, care anymore. Man. Don't care. I guess I never, I never the during mall. the early stages of Bullet Club, like anything went, but like even during AJ Styles, and then they really didn't do this at all under Kenny. So it was really just like a couple years there. But even with AJ, it's like they didn't really do it like this, where you know it almost becomes sort of almost like a, a satirical what they're doing. Yeah. Well, like, it's just been, it, and it's been going it's on. It's like so WCW. Long. Yeah. Right? It, it's it just, like late stage WCW. Like you're just yeah. looking and nothing matters until. You know, Yoshinobu Kanemaru comes flying out of the curtain with his whiskey. Yeah, and it's just, I mean, it's just, it, it ruins some matches. I Like, there'll be occasional matches where, like, um, you know, they'll do the interference. Usually it's an LIJ match, right? They'll do the interference, and mm -hmm. eventually when the LIJ guys come out, the crowd pops, um, and then the baby face beats evil or whatever. And, like, it's mm -hmm. like, okay, like, it did work there, but... It most of the time I feel like it doesn't. And it just it's honestly it's like offensive to me because it's not creative anymore. It's not like these are creative spots. It's the same, you know, Kanamara with the whiskey bottle, um, Dick Togo with the garrote wire. It's just it's, it's like and it's the powder. Yeah, it's don't forget like, the powder. It's the same New wrinkle. It's the same spots over and over again. It's been happening for years. And like they just keep getting away with it. I think of any other wrestling promotion. <laughs> just did this so consistently yeah. night after night after night the same spots over and over again it would get 
ripped to shreds and i just i don't like it but uh anyway uh, you know on. i can i can i'll i have thoughts on that but i'll, I'll save it for evil actually yeah ren I mean, narita just sucks well like and the thing with ren narita is that like i think ren narita, be better. I, yeah he could be better and, like he they they ha i understand they had to pivot from the son of strong style stuff because i felt like that just never got over and it kind of felt unearned oh um, i would disagree there i would disagree because it, it was awful but the the shota amino Renarita sort of like you know Fujoshi bait tag team nonsense mm -hmm. I thought it was actually getting Renarita responses for the first time like he kind of worked in that tag team dynamic mm -hmm. but then they broke him up after a month so here we are yeah. a year later I thought uh I think Joe Lanza made a good point when he was talking about uh, Yoshinawa Agawa um and how like just like Good, like your good solid mid card undercard worker that can kind of just put together matches like that's something that mm -hmm. has kind of been undervalued and he, he mentioned like Brenda Rita like maybe could have been that guy sure but instead they pivoted his character into being like yet another interference laden guy I guess he's like wait, he's is he the number two guy in House of Torture probably right I mean I guess he would be just by process of elimination yeah, because the other there's really like it's evil and like everyone else isn't really protected at all. I mean, um, I guess it would be show, but you're not going to consider a junior your number two guy. Yeah, but I guess like yeah. if you were looking at an open weight, I would say show mm -hmm. as the only other good member. But Ren's not. He's running out with that little push up bar. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> anyway, it's, it's uh, just farcical. Yeah. Uh, controversial uh, name here for for some people. Uh, Callum Newman. I don't know, because it's like, where was his stock before this? I mean, I guess I would say, I, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to try to be swayed by, by, you know, what's out there in the discourse. I'll say just stock even, because ultimately, like, his, his goal in the G1 was to just be in a G1. Mm -hmm. And he was. So he did it. Yeah, so I, I would slide towards, I mean, I thought he was aggressively fine. Yeah, yeah. The G1. I think, I, you know, there were some, I saw some comments about him being like really, really bad, like dragging down the G1. And I was like, I, I, I think he's, you know, he's on, he's first or second match pretty much every night. Yeah, he didn't um, mean enough. Like, he's just, he's fine. It did get kind of rough as the tournament went on. Like, he definitely lost his legs and wasn't able to mm -hmm. go as fast as he could, which is kind of a problem when your gimmick is that you're fast. But he's the prince of pace. He's the prince of pace. I, I, yeah, thanks for the alliteration, pal. Well, pace is a uh, soccer term, you know. In oh, soccer, is it? you don't. Yeah, it, well, it's like a, a English soccer term. Like you, you don't say someone's fat. You don't necessarily say someone's fast or something like that. You'd be like, they've got like if a player is fast, you'd say like he's got tremendous pace, or he's just like, you know, he doesn't have the pace to keep up. Like it's 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 used very frequently in terms oh of just God. saying speed or fast. So that's where it comes you from. You know, anytime I think I just can't handle being in wrestling culture anymore, I think. Real sports culture can be so much worse. And soccer <laughs> culture, football culture, association football culture is like, honestly, maybe the worst in the world. In terms of like what, like engaging in like fan discourse? That and like whenever you see some real dickhead online, especially in wrestling, like some WWE honk or whatever. Yeah. Or just like if you're online and it's like, okay, so this person's virulently anti-transgender. Well, they're definitely from England. We can just start from there. And then it's like, oh, yeah, there's the soccer jersey. Or it's like, you know, somebody's like trying to troll AEW fans. And as an outsider, I'm like, you know, what's the point of this? And it's like, yep, there we go. There's the full kit. Yeah. There he is. This Manchester, and they're mostly Manchester United fans. Or, or, you know, I also throw in Liverpool and Arsenal as potential uh, fan bases to be like that. Um, Shota Umino. <laughs> let's see so i'm never really sure what's public knowledge at this point um he's 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 a naughty boy um which is probably not a all right actually you know that's actually probably a bad way to put it because what some people say he's done is actually pretty heinous um if it's true um 
I don't know. Like, it, it's hard because you hear like rumors about him, and some of them are out there about the way he treats women or or yeah. just pursues women. For the sake of this conversation, let's just focus on performance. Right. Well, so well, so like, I guess what I'm getting at is that it's hard to like see how he's very regressive right now, and he just seems lost. He just seems so profoundly lost. Like he doesn't really know what's going on. They don't know exactly what to do with him. And it's hard not to think like, is this some sort of like interpersonal turmoil that's coming out under the camera? But, you know, when I take a breath and it's like, no, it, it, it's, it, it just seems like he's in this period where he's not going to be pushed to the level of Suji right now. And maybe he's just sort of treading water himself. And, you know, He's somebody that I think they still value quite a bit because uh, if you do look at his slate, which uh, Samsa pointed this out, he beat all the big guys in his block. Like he beat Evil, um, he beat Great Okan, and he beat Zack Sabre Jr., and he beat Shingo Takagi. Um, as far as like four mat, like losing records, that's like the strongest losing record in the G1. It's like, in fact, Looking at his win slate, it's kind of stronger than some of the guys who won, you know, five or six matches. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think that's a pretty clear indicator that they still believe in him and they still want him to do something. But I'd have to stay stocked down because the crowds are turning on him. Like, they're not buying it. And he's not coming across as authentic anymore right now. He just seems like he just is just profoundly perplexed. Like, his backstage comments, which I think are a clear like sign and indicator of where somebody is mentally he just doesn't seem as as fervent with them so i mean i'm i'm i don't know where they go from here but you know i still believe he's he's got the potential to be a top guy among suji and uemura we're just in a very weird point with him right now yeah i just think overall for me i just find him to have a frustrating lack of consistency where yeah. he has some moments where I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, like, Omino's going to be a top guy. He's got it. And then he has other moments where I'm like, Ooh, this guy's, like, way not, is not ready at all and isn't over and it's going badly. Um, and it's kind of hard for me to make heads or tails, especially when you add in some of the other stuff that you alluded to in terms of his reputation backstage and things like that. Right. Um, yeah, it, it's just strange. He, I mean, I think it's pretty clear that he's regressed since New Japan Cup. And I think I think that's the best way to put it, actually, what you said. Like, there's just no way to really explain it. Like, mm -hmm. how, like, he, he's just let himself go a bit. Got to get back on track, which I think he can. And I think he will. But right now, it's it's a bit rough. How about Hanare? Now, this is controversial because I'm going to say stock up. However... I think he's really got in his own head about what a never match should look like. And I think he came into the tournament thinking that he has to have a never match every night. And he's trying so hard to do it that it does sort of become like a, you know, like the, the, the facade is sort of out there where, you know, I liked his matches coming into the tournament a bit. So, you know, I know people are really down on him, especially because of that stuff. I think he's doing fine. You know, I think he did a little bit better in this G1 than he normally does. He ended up with four, uh, eight points, which is about where a never champion usually ends up anyway. So I, I would say like a very light stock up. Yeah, I think he's just like a good fit for the G1 in terms of just being a guy that's going to go out there, be pro probably has a you know he probably has a ceiling if he's not i guess he doesn't have a ceiling if he's wrestling shingo takaki but in any other situation right. he kind of has a ceiling on how good he can be but i feel like there's this real solidness to his work that's appreciated i liked his match against oleg bolton it wasn't really like oh yeah yeah a great match but like when the bell rang it's like here are these two guys that just feel like legit tough guys and they're gonna beat each other up for 10 minutes and it just felt like proper in a way that there was a lot of stuff in this tournament where I'm like, oh, it's this guy. Or like, oh, this, you know, this guy's doing a gimmick. This guy's doing, you know, whatever. Got away for interference or whatever. And then you have like, okay, here's Oleg Bolton and Hanare. And they're just going to give each other like forearms and shit for 10 minutes. It's going to yeah, be pretty awesome. good. Yeah. 
Um, I mean, I'm fine with him because at, at least he has a vision of what he wants. Right. And, it, and, and, and it, it fits into what I expect to see in New Japan. Yeah. Which for me, as someone that watches like a lot of different promotions, I'm like, I'm looking for New Japan to provide a certain thing for me. And I think what mm. Hanare does is in line with what I feel like New Japan provides, which is like mostly like no nonsense guy is going to be like work kind of stiff come across mm -hmm. convincing and the matches are going to be have a baseline of, of solidness to them oh, it's interesting because i pretty much at this point i'm just watching new japan and ddt and maybe i'll catch some noah or tokyo mm -hmm. joshi pro stuff on on universe so i'm very actually interested to hear the perspective of somebody that does watch a lot of different promotions I mean, just, yeah, I mean, it's just like part of, I think that's where some of my criticisms for New Japan get into is like, it's like, if I want to watch guys with like heavy gimmicks or stuff like that, like there's a lot of that in American wrestling. I think just like right. my relationship with New Japan is like, I didn't like what was going on in American wrestling. So I started watching New Japan. And so like, I looked to New Japan for like like it seems ridiculous to say it, it was like toa hanare is like the, the mascot of what i my my vision of new japan right. it's just whatever toa hanare is but like well, that's what he wants to be well if that's but that's what i like when, when like i said when i saw the oleg bolton hanare match which again was not like an amazing match that anyone's gonna remember it's like a match of the year contender or anything like that but there was just like a quintessential like yes this is a proper g1 match it's not renderita with a push up bar it's not shoda amino coming out with his weird reaction it's not jake lee being a smart bastard or whatever it's it's like here are just two guys giving each other they're just going to give each other forearms and like you know get do like run into each other at full speed and that's you know like i gotta say like it's a it's a proper new japan match uh to me yeah and and i yeah. think you know i think a lot of the stuff that you didn't like was was somewhat present during those peak 2010 years oh it definitely it's, was sure and, and not that you were aren't aware of that it's just they could get away with stuff in the 2010s because the top was so strong and i just think because the top tier like you said it's pretty much naito right now and then a bunch of sort of disarray floating underneath him. Mm -hmm. And I think as they gradually sort of mold that into shape, I think that, you know, those things will start accentuating like the positives again. But right now we've just got to wait for that shape to take form. But that's an interesting perspective for sure. How about El Phantasmo? Sock down. Um, I mean, you know, I was higher on his G1 than, you know... I don't want to get too swayed by what they're saying in the Discord because they are very virulent about what they think. No, I but... don't care about those people at all. <laughs> well, they, you know, not to, to say it, but they, they, for some reason, they, they do not like you. And That's they don't okay. ever talk about me. But, you know, what are you going to do? They, anybody that writes for the website, I think they hate. So, <laughs> the uh, Elfant, I mean, they are somewhat right. Like, the Elfantasmo stuff was ridiculous. Like, reaching for a tag during a singles match to yeah, show like, just how profoundly like, he He's... like the moroseness of like my friend. And it's like, it's hard not to just think like, buddy, who gives a fuck? Even in kayfabe terms, you're, you're finally free from this nonsense and a tag team that nobody cared about, you know, which I mean, they, I actually kind of like their tag team, but like, you know, it wasn't like He's this gone. iconic team. It's not like, no. you know, Ricky Morton can't make the tag to Robert Gibson because Robert Gibson's not there. Right. And even there, like, I mean, they, they won the titles, right? But, like, they didn't really hold the titles for very long anyway. Like, you know, it's another example of sort of this weird resetting that they did where, uh, you know, everybody that won a title at Wrestle Kingdom kind of lost it at New Beginning besides Naito. So, like, you know, they win the title at January 4, and then they've lost it by February 11th, and that's it. So, yeah, I mean, you know, it was it was some very overwrought melodrama, but he did also have that Takeshita match where they clearly just said, we're going to go out and have the match of the tournament. And for me, they probably did. So, you know, we know what he's capable of. We just... Please just let him go wrestle and just be El Phantasmo. Yeah, I mean he's he t he told a story. Um, uh, he did. He told a story in this tournament. He... Well, most stories are bad, so. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, maybe uh, 
Does he have any, um, can we dig up any like Polynesian ancestry for him? Because he might be a good fit in WWE with his, you know, over the top storytelling, like reaching for his tag, reaching for a tag that isn't there in the G1. Well, he's, he's. So he, everyone he, knows, you know, everyone knows he's sad. Right. The announcers say it every single right. time. Uh, he says it in every promo. Everyone needs to know that he's sad. Right. If there's any doubt that wrestling is ultimately theater, it's the play to the back row nonsense that has been sort of apotheosized right now. Um, well, I mean, he's an honorary Tongan. That is true. And that's all it takes, They did man. give it to him. Yeah. I mean, he's not old enough to go to WWE yet, but, you know, soon enough it, he will is, be. Is he, is, he, is, he, is, he, is he older than you think? Like, He's 38, I think. Yeah, so what do you think? He's got two more years where it's 4-0? Four, four uh, he's 37, about to turn 38. So a couple more years. Also sad to think, like, They've wasted a lot of years of this guy's prime where I thought he could have been a real major face in this yeah. promotion. But I mean, that's when I said I did like kind of a G1 breakdown uh, like half, you know. halfway through the tournament. And I, my kind of thoughts on El Fantasma was like, I think there was a point in time where he had like real, like a real chance to be like a prominent baby face. It's not like a top, top guy, but like a never yeah. open champion baby face level guy. And I think that ceiling has probably been lowered. Yeah, yeah, it's unfortunate because I think he he's got a high ceiling for me. But he, he's also like an I think like an inconsistent guy in terms of like he can go out and like that to catch the match is a good example. Like he can go out and he can have a match where you're like this El Fantasmo guy, he's as good as anyone else in the world that wrestles his kind of style. And then he'll have other matches where you'll be like, Okay, this guy's really whether he's dogging it, whether he's trying to get a a story over. It's just he doesn't have he probably has like on his best day, he can look as good as someone like Takeshita or Will Ospreay. But yes, that day can. is very that day is infrequent. Yeah. Um, and, and I also think like whatever direction they're giving him or or just him in general, it just seems like he's always been a little bit uncertain about how to be a baby face in Japan as opposed mm -hmm. to how he was in England. So, I mean, you know, we've got to figure it out now because. I mean, I really feel like we've still got a number of solid years with this guy, and he's just so fucking talented. They just got to do something substantial with him and not so fucking stupid. Yeah. He, first thing he needs to do, he needs to get some merch that is like the Bullet Club logo, but it is in this like shape and style of the 1990s Vancouver Canucks logo. Because like when he first signed with New... He used to have that... like um yeah. thing with when he was wrestling in england and like when he signed with new japan i'm like oh we're gonna get like some awesome merch with like it's gonna be the you know the bullet club but it's gonna have the 90s vancouver canucks like the black and yellow kind of theme like that's gonna be rad and we've never gotten it so that's a free idea you know, that's a good that's a good point actually like what's missing from el phantasmo is the joy like he was just a joyful wrestler to watch like even during the pandemic like remember when he was doing like that the long boom. Yeah, and that was yeah. fun. Yeah. We missed that. I missed yeah. Juan El Fantasmo. No, he's a sad boy now. Oh, what a bad decision. He should come out and like, he's like head banging, but he's doing it really sad and slow. Um, um, Zach Sabre Jr., I think we can all agree, stock down, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's fucking boring. Yeah. You know, like, jump, motherfucker. Can't you jump? I know you got yeah. an odd shape, but get <laughs> get at the top rope and take a dove. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, we talked about him. Just you yeah, know, stock up, and he's he, you know, like he just simply is like. I mean, if we're talking about things that New Japan can do to separate them, as like I kind of feel like AEW and WWE have made them the template for what they do, <laughs> or at least I think so. I haven't watched AEW in a couple of years, but like. Zack Sabre Jr. is just something that you can't find. There's just nobody who wrestles like him. Even guys who do grapple stuff. Like, he's just so frenetic. He just has no patience. He moves from one thing to another. And yeah, it's just all this a, chain stuff. He, he's just totally unique. He's a unique... That's that's exactly... He's a unique wrestler. And his... What I love about him, especially in a tournament, tournament setting, is he is the only wrestler um, that I watch on a regular basis that legitimately feel like his matches could end at literally any time 
because he has so yeah. many he because of how many different types of wins he gets whether through submissions or various different cool looking roll-ups mm -hmm. like when he goes through the motions he gets someone in a submission hold or he gets someone in a roll-up like you feel like the match can legitimately end and there's a level of ex excitement and can't look away to that kind of work that nobody else has because pretty much everyone wrestles the same style where it's like the match isn't going to end until someone hits their finisher right. um and everything else is kind of like window dressing which is i don't really necessarily have a problem with that it's like just the accepted nature of pro wrestling pretty much across the board and zach is like one of the few right. very rare exceptions where it doesn't that doesn't come into play where it's like zach's on the mat the match could end at any second and it's been established time and time again um and it makes it so interesting like he he'll win a match with a certain type of roll up one night and the next night he'll go for that same roll up again and the you know you'll be like oh my god he's gonna do the same roll up again he's gonna win and when the guy kicks out it's like oh i really bought it there because he's established that he can win like that um yeah and you hear it in the crowds too yeah oh like yeah the, you know i mean obviously he's been there for like eight years in in new japan and like i guess about 10 total but like that you saw it in the final like you know We've seen him get the flash submissions. Like um, he did it on Shingo, I think in 2021, where he just got that arm bar, which was very cool. But like, there's almost nothing as dramatic as Zach sort of like, you know, against Suji, he just like went from, he has one limb. Now he has two limbs. Now he has three. And you hear the crowd, just like the escalation as he's like, not slowly, but as he sort of like, you know, carefully escalates the submission. And people get more and more excited in the crowd. But, you know, then there was like this real big, you know, climactic release at the end when he finally got the, the I guess it was a verbal submission. But like mm -hmm. it works in this context. It works where he is. Uh, great Okan. Oh, finally, I can say stock up. Oh, I've been waiting for this since he was a young lion. Like it was a good I, showing for him. Yeah. If you're a young lion and you do gut wrenches, you're my favorite fucking young lion. So, and it never fails. Great Okan was the, the gut wrench guy. Uh, Oleg Bolton was the gut wrench guy. O uh, uh, Oiwa was a gut wrench guy. And we know where he's coming. I mean, he's coming hard when, if they get him back. So, you know, was I'm Katsuya glad. Was you know, Kitamura not a gut wrench guy? Oh, he probably was too, wasn't he? can't remember i mean it, it seems it impossible really... that he wasn't right i think yeah i think him and oka might have both been gut wrench guys god and you know and you know what? i'm glad you mentioned that because like to me you know again i watch the backstage comments religiously and you don't have to watch them right they're, they're perfect supplementary material where like if you watch them it enhances things like exponentially but you don't have to watch them Great Okans has been amazing from the beginning. Like he talks in this sort of manner, like he's some imperial minister or some like, you know, enlightened despot. And he, you know, uses like these like wild phrases or however they're translated. But like he also gives like like that um backstage comment last year that he made after Kitamiya died in the accident. It's it was like I, I really implore anybody to go back and find it or watch it because like, I've never seen anything more affecting. Like, he's just blubbering, talking about, like, how much he admired that guy. And you look at that and you think, like, here's a guy that expresses any emotion. Here's a guy that's, like, so sincere and earnest, even though he's playing this, you know, weird hodgepodge character from all points of Asian history. And, and like, he's a guy who saved a young girl in real life from, like, an attacker and carried around the certificate he got from the police and stuff. And it's just like, what do you want from this guy? And they finally did it. And I thought, I, you know, I thought he lived up to it. I thought his matches were great. And, you know, the big test is going to be against Naito soon. But I think he's changed his style a bit. He's had a bit more impact. He's up the pace a bit. So I, I think we're finally getting it. I think it's finally happening. Yeah, I mean, it's been a roller coaster for, I'm like you, I'm an Ocon enthusiast. And I, you know, I loved him as a young boy. You know, he, he yeah. was there with Kitamura at the same time, but like he yep. was very different than the other young boys, like totally different look, amateur background, significantly larger than most of the other guys in his class. Yep. Um, and it's like, oh, this is great. New Japan's got this nice, you know, new big hoss that they're going to have toss around people. That's cool. 
then he went to England and then he had the, and that's when the Okan gimmick came in and it basically varies. him and like, how much is he doing the gimmick usually correlates with how much, how high I am on him. And when he's really heavily leaning into the gimmick, I'm lower on him. And I thought when he came back, I was like, okay, he's disappointing. Then when he, you know, maybe like a year in and started kind of moving up the card a little bit, I was like, okay, this guy, you know, like I'm back on Okan. And then I was down on him again. And then when he was in the tag right. team, I was like, oh, you know, I'm kind of liking this Okan again. And then I was down on him again. And I thought last year I was like really down on him in the G1 because I thought not only did I not think he was like super good, but I also just got the sense like they've got all these other young guys like Suji um, and Uminu and mm-hmm. these guys that are coming back and they have these interesting guys who are like Oiwa who still was a like, young lion at the time. I was like, I have a feeling that Greta Khan's in danger of being passed by because right. he never really hit the level he needed to hit at. And now he's got younger guys coming up behind him. Um, but obviously stock up this tournament for all the reasons you mentioned. I think he he's wrestling with more urgency, which again, I attribute to not relying so much like on the gimmick and doing like the, the spots and things like that mm-hmm. that he would do. Honestly, it's it's a big thing for me is ditching the pants. Yes. Yes. Like I get why he was wearing the pants, but, and it really, but yeah. And I shouldn't really make that big of a difference, but like it does, it's like, yeah. And it it was annoying. And it was, was, it's just kind of annoying because it's like, you have this guy who's a pretty rare talent in terms of like the new Japan dojo of being like just his size and his ability. Well, and you mentioned he was, he wasn't just like a, an amateur wrestler. He was the national champion. Yeah. He was a super high level amateur wrestler. And he like just his look like when he was with his kind of like shave like I don't I don't really know describe how to describe his hair when he was a young boy it wasn't quite a shaved head um, he was balding yeah it was but like Hiding he just balding. yeah and he had like the cauliflower ears he just looked totally different than everyone yeah. else um, and I was like oh man who's this guy he's gonna be a star and then he was like saddled with this gimmick and now he's basically he's still doing the gimmick but like he just to me he's like okay he's back to just being a big convincing badass that's giving people overhead suplexes and stuff like that yeah well it's sort of like um you know what it reminds me of it's like like before undertaker became biker taker in like 97 like 96 97 mm-hmm. where like he's still doing like the undertaker gimmick but like he's basically just a guy right like he's just a guy like he didn't become like i'm not a dead man thing but like that sort of cool space where you know, it the gimmick was like more. Yeah. He, even though was, obviously they did all the goofy stuff too, but like it was like this is just a, a a guy now. He's just a wrestler who does this. Like we've we've normalized what he is. The gimmick is just an aesthetic. It is not weighing yes. in on the actual character. And it's interesting you mentioned that. I remember I was doing um this is a long time ago. I was doing a Wrestle Kingdom post show on the Wrestling Inc. podcast back in my Wrestling Inc. Ooh. days. Uh oh, um, guys, who, <laughs> don't wish Vince any birthdays, please. It was, uh, it was uh, not not one of those guys. It was my co-host. Okay. Um, <laughs> but the guy I was watching, he was kind of like a casual New Japan fan, and I was kind of on as like the um, you know guy who watches New Japan a lot that knows like all the angles and stuff like that. And one of the things he mentioned to me was he he specifically talked about evil at the time, and he was like, I like with New Japan that like the care the guys come out with like entrances and they might you know evil obviously his name is evil so it's kind of like this character but when he gets out there he's right. you know he's just like a, he's still just like a normal wrestler and his character is not right. overwhelmed by this gimmick and yep. like this guy who mainly watched american wrestling was like um he's like i like that you know that i it's like these guys are still at, these guys can have like characteristics and aesthetics that make it look cool but they're not just they're still like just actual wrestlers it's not being overwhelmed right. by like doing magic or shit like that mm-hmm. um yes, anyway good. so uh uh jeff uh greater cons how about greater cons tag team partner jeff cobb well i mean for me it, this is tricky because like i love jeff cobb jeff cobb is is probably one of my top five wrestlers right now i think everything he does is incredible but it you know like i kind of feel like they should push him strong every g1 and he was sort of in the mix at the end, although, you know, I kind of had to go through all this stuff for my, you know, article leading into the final nights. And it's like, technically, Jeff Cobb was alive, but like, he really didn't have any realistic paths. And you knew he was going to lose to Suji anyway. Um, 
I'm going to say stock even, but nah, you know what? I'm going to say slightly up. I just, I just don't think anybody truly like, he doesn't get enough credit. I feel I, I feel like the company doesn't give him enough credit. And I feel like the, like the work that he does is so just solid and the fans eat it up over there. Everything he does, you know, he's like, he's almost in like where Okan is where you're just like wondering why aren't they trying a bit more with him considering how much the fans like him considering how unique he is too and like he's never had an IWGP title match he's never challenged for the title and it's just baffling to me um but you know it's another one where he's just sort of in the mix so I, I'll say slightly up but I wish it was it was more up yeah, for me, Cobby just he does he does he's he seems he just I think he has a ceiling that's he seems to often be in second gear to me. It's very rare for me where I'm like, hey, Jeff Cobb has a match where I'm like, oh that Jeff Cobb match was amazing. I think he's solid and provides a decent baseline, but he doesn't deliver at the highest level for me um, as an in-ring performer. Um how about Haruki Goto? I mean, you've got to say stock up, right? I mean, the guy came in and you were wondering why he automatically got in, which I guess it was like, you know, the official reason, I guess, because he's a former champion. Yeah, like some so years that's good won. enough for him to automatically be in, but other years it's like, oh, Goto, right. maybe he's not going to make it. And it's like, well, which is it? But I guess well, it changes actually, every year because the format changes every year now. Well, you know, it's fake. <laughs> and sometimes they just let you know right off the bat. But, you know, with him, I think he's had he hasn't really had a, even a, a really good G1 in a while. Um, you know, he was fine during the pandemic, but those were the pandemic ones. He wasn't really great in these smaller blocks. So I wasn't really expecting much. I just expected sort of a meager, you know, like swan song. And, you know, lo and behold, he uh, he stole the middle of the tournament where everybody was interested in what he was doing. Um you know, I mean, that Suji match was incredible. Uh, that was in, what building was that? Because he, uh, that was in Fukuoka. Um, you know, the guy was to the point where, you know, rational people were thinking, why not put the title on him? I mean, if we're, you know, especially if you're not going to go with Suji or the young guys. And, you know, it was a convincing argument. I mean, you know, I think he was... You know, the, the common thing about him was, you know, he's the, the, the gatekeeper of history, right? Where you can say, like, you know, somebody of Goto's level didn't win the world title, which makes the world title mean, mean you know, more. And now it's just like, well, you know, why not give him a Nakanishi title reign? I mean, fuck, he's 45 and he was one of the top performers in the G1. So, you know, I think on every level he had an incredible tournament. Yeah, I mean, if if the winner of the G one was just going to main event Kings of Pro Wrestling, oh yeah, like why couldn't Hiroki Goto have that with like the momentum coming out of the G one? Because, um, I mean, he, you know, there's a story, there's an obvious story to be told there of him being kind of really the last one of his generation that's in this G one. I guess him and, and Naito would be the two, um, and he performs at a really high level, uh, and he had a great tournament, and I mean. The G in G1 stands for Goto. Um, so. Sure fucking does. I mean, he also has been hurt a lot the last few years. So maybe he's just a bit healthier now. But I mean, that guy just I knows mean, how to have a fucking match. I mean, he looked great. You know, you see some of these guys like, you know, we're used to, we, we, we know what Tanahashi looks like now. We know yeah. what Naito looks like now. We know what Nakamura looks like now. So it's kind of. Yeah. Like sometimes I feel like I lump Goto in that I'm like, oh well, Goto's got to be like in that same class because he's you know just physically. But he, I mean, he looked great in this tournament. Yeah, um, he's he's really more like him and Segura, right? It's kind of like those guys. Yeah, I, I'm uh, assuming Segura looks, still looks good. Yeah, um, yeah, Segura's like in his fifties now, I think at least. Yeah, he was like older than all of them. Yeah, well, didn't Segura didn't he like not start wrestling until he was like forty? He started late, yeah. I think he was in like his mid or late thirties. Yeah, I mean, like, well, pro wrestling. Pro- pro- Obviously, he had a, yeah, a yeah, long yeah. Um, how about Sonata? Well, stock down. 
I mean, obviously, like last year, he was the champion and he went undefeated. He you know, I, 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 and he did. And I don't know, like, I looked through the matches and, like, you know, him being that Jake Lee opening match almost feels like a fucking prank. Like, these, those two guys, and, like, you know what Jake Lee's limitations are, and your first match against him is going to be Sonata. Like, I appreciate the methodicalness of Sonata probably more than most. Um, but he, I don't know, felt like he sort of moonwalked through this one, except for uh, the, the Shingo match was incredible. Um, and the Zach match on the final night was awesome. But, I mean, those two have some of the best chemistry of any pairing in the company. You know, it was just typical sort of floating Sonata where, you know, when you really, like, dissect it out of context, it's like, yeah, this is this is really high level work that he's doing but it's not really captivating work yeah he just he's japanese randy orton to me he looks the part well watch your handbag <laughs> he he moves the, he moves around the ring really well he can do all of the stuff he's a great athlete he will occasionally do have a match or something like that We're like man this guy's great um yeah but he's just he doesn't have that high of a ceiling at this point and it just feels like he has he has this really negative stigma i think about being a guy that hit his ceiling and is now on the way back down which is a tough spot to be yeah like, although i they, kind of appreciate that because like if you know i've really scoured through every g1 result the last few years for my my stuff mm -hmm. and you do see this happen more than you you've seen in recent years where it's like you know, Naito, and, because it's been so, like, like this tetrarchy or, or whatever of, like, Naito and, and Ibushi and Okada and Tanahashi and whoever, where those guys never really drop down, like, an off year for them is, like, 10 or 12 points. But when you really look back at the history of the G1, you'd see guys like, you know, Ricky Choshu won it in 96 going undefeated, but there's also years where Choshu, like, lost every match or won one match. Or, like, you'd see Tenzon. Like, they do this to Tenzon, who won a bunch of them. He'd, like, you know, win the G1, and then the next year he'd be, like, fifth out of sixth. Yeah, he's Mr. August or whatever. Yeah, so if they do that to him, you know. So maybe it's just sort of return to that. Or it could just be that, you know, Sonata had his chance and it's back to where he belongs. Give me your hot take on the smart bastard, Jake Lee. Did you know he was a smart bastard? I feel like that was... After all... I feel like that was emphasized more like than on commentary than like, at least I'm listening to the English commentary, but like that was em emphasized more than like any other character they've ever introduced ever in terms of like really trying to get this nickname. That's not particularly good over. Oh, it's interesting to hear because I, um, I, I listened to the Japanese just for the ambiance and they, I did hear them say smart bastard a number of times, but it didn't feel like they were relentless about it. There's this something they like... weren't relentless about, but sorry, I'll talk about but... later, but. I was gonna say, this was like any time he did anything in the ring, like got out of the way of a guy making an attack. They'd be like, oh, there's that, there's a smart bastard, Jake Lee. <laughs> like, it was yeah, he didn't really wrestle like a smart bastard for me, you know? And like Chris Charlton talked about how we were going to be like flabbergasted and amazed by his, his speaking abilities and his backstage comments when most of the time, like half the time he didn't give a backstage comment. The other time he has this like weird cadence where he sort of like stops after every sentence. Um, you know, he, he has a cool like tone and timber to his voice. And obviously like he has a, at least a presence in front of like the backstage camera, but yeah, I, I'm just not compelled by him in ring. I'm not like, I don't really like the, the knee to the gut thing, which is sort of like the turning point of all of his matches. And like, it looks fine, but it doesn't really excite me. So there's like a disconnect there. But you know what? I'm going to have to say stock up because this tag team with Gabe Kidd is compelling to me and I am captivated by it. And, you know, like I said, like there's something about watching wrestling where like, like kind of what you said before about like proper New Japan, where proper New Japan, you know, there are baby faces and heels, but it's not as pronounced in most cases. Mm-hmm. You know, you'll have the outliers everywhere, but like, there's just something about watching wrestlers who are teaming together, even if they're heels, just like being around each other. And 
you know, Gabe Kidd is like super popular now. And I think it's going to, I think this is like a genius decision because I think Jake Lee and that tag team is going to be really fun. Yeah. Would you say he's like a smart bastard for that decision? He doesn't wrestle like one. <laughs> and like, we'll talk about like gimmicks not matching it because Yota Suji doesn't wrestle like his gimmick either. But yeah, no, I, 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 you know, I guess it's like that, that thing where, you know, like if you're a band, you're really cool if you have an English name in Jap in Japanese. Mm-hmm. I just wonder what people think because it's like it's in English and he's saying it. Like, what is the the average Japanese wrestling fan who's at like you know Hamamatsu or like the Hiroshima Sun Plaza, like even know what the fuck that is? Yeah, I'm not even sure I know really what it means. Like in the context of a wrestler, you know, being a wrestler. And honestly, when he was like steampunk monocle guy, that seemed like more of a like smart bastard presentation than this sort of like tall dude with Joshi pants that he is right now. That, but I, you know what? You know what? The 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 mad bastards. I'm all about that. Yeah, that's okay. Um, Yua Iwimura, I think. Well, actually, there's two takeaways you can have from this tournament. De- definitely stock up. Unfortunately, it's like, what are you going to do with it? It's like, you know, I guess like to torture an analogy, it's like, you know, you have like stocks that are up and then the company just like folds. Because like from everything we hear, his his elbow is in really rough shape and this might be a while before he's back. But he's my guy. I think he's the chosen one. Uh, I don't think that Okada dropkick was, was you know, random. Um, you know, even beyond that, like, uh, when he was a young lion, he was the young lion that Jay White would pick on. And obviously who's right next to Jay White is he's picking on him, you know, like, oh, you, yeah, blah, blah, blah. So I always sort of had a sense that they thought really highly of him. Um, obviously they've given him like the sparsest presentation you could give, Mm -hmm. like doing him no favors, um, really pushing him weird. And obviously like. You know, six months after he's back, he's in lemon eating competitions with Great Ocon. And you're just wondering, like, what are we doing with it? But, like, he seems like he's made for the G1. Like, that earnestness that he has, that sincerity that he has, and just like all those, like, rock solid fundamentals, which he then expanded, right? So he expanded on stuff. He added some stuff this, this G1. You know, he was like the star of the first half of the tournament to me. Yeah, if you were doing like like a percentage increase in terms of like yes, whose stock yes. multiplied the most, it would I mean it would almost it would it have to be you and more or Oleg Bolton in terms of just sure. where they went um and where they were versus where people see them now. The injury is like pretty devastating from a time perspective. Um yeah. but maybe not, you know, maybe maybe not the worst thing in the world, especially if they didn't have any follow up plans for him. Yeah, if he's just gonna flounder and, and um, fall, then yeah, then this might give him some opportunity. When he comes back, people will maybe remember and think that he has some momentum. I agree with you that like he really hasn't been given anything to do until he made this G one for the most part. Yeah, um, which kind of contrasts with the idea like, okay, do they really view him as this chosen one if they have like no seemingly have put in no creative effort into him at all? Um, but then you look at how he was booked in this G1, you're like, okay, well, clearly they see something in him. Uh, and maybe and maybe the, the return from injury, he'll get like, you know, I don't know how long he's going to be out for this injury. It, it sounds like it could be, you know, through the end of the year, which would probably put him right. missing Wrestle Kingdom. But can't you see him coming back like at one of the events early in, in quarter one and just being oh, yeah. like, I'm like, oh yeah, like really giving them a, a nice spark um, as a, maybe he's, shows up and he's in the new Japan cup and he wins the new Japan cup, or maybe he shows up at new year's dash or something like that. I guess a lot of it depends on the nature of his elbow injury. Um, yeah. And when he would be able to come back. Uh, David Finley. One thing on new mm-hmm. I, I think he kind of fits like what you want new Japan to be possibly more than anybody though, because he's very pure. Like his wrestling is very pure and he's very pure, and I think you saw that connection can be made. It's just like Suji's very like pronounced and flamboyant, and he's pushed hard. Shoto mm-hmm. Amino pushed hard, very flamboyant. 
Ren Narita given a gimmick where, like, you know, you boo on command. And he hasn't been given anything, so I think, like, it takes more time for him, but I think you saw, like, it's almost like they, they trust him to be able to get over with nothing. And he did. And I highly recommend. Uh, they're doing this YouTube series uh, called, uh, what is it? It's either you, New Heroes or Young Heroes um, on the New Japan YouTube page. And it's, it's translated into English, and they're basically following around all the young guys. Uh, yeah, New Japan's New Heroes. First episode was Yota Suji, and the second episode was Yua Uemura. You've got to see the Uemura episode. They follow him on like his promotional tour in uh, Fukuoka, and it's insane. He does like 10 interviews a day, but he's very endearing. So, you know, just like that supplemental stuff that can, can really get a wrestler over the top. How do you feel about David Finley? You kind of already alluded to this. Yeah, David Finley was my number two guy. I had him almost uh, averaging like about three eight, three nine a match, like almost four stars a match. Like, I feel like David Finley is a long project, or he was, and like so many things got in the way. So like he got sick during New Japan Cup, right, and had to bow out. Um, you know, he disappeared at times when they were pushing him near the end of the pandemic. You know, they had him win the Never title last year and then he lost it. But, you know, another thing that I like to point out, he didn't join Bullet Club and take this role until, like, spring 2023. Like, we're not even a year and a half into the, the Rebel. Like, this is still kind of fresh to me. And, you know, it was kind of rough because it definitely felt like he was figuring out what he wanted that character to be and how he wanted to wrestle, but I feel like he knows what he wants right now. He's going to powerbomb people, and he's going to do big moves, and he's just going to sort of, you know, jaw jack all match, and, you know, I think his sense of, like, controlling the match has gotten significantly better. I just hope we can have some sort of momentum for longer than a few months with him, but, no, I, I honestly think he's one of the best wrestlers they have right now. And I think he's made himself into that. But, you know, it's it's kind of a like a slow burn with him. So, like, it may just not captivate you. And if you're not sort of in from the beginning, you just might not find a way in. But I, I think he's doing things to make his matches less than, like... I think, like, he only worked as, like, a 15 to 20 minute slow burn. And now I think he's, like, able to do a 10 to 12 minute match and have it be good. And I think there's a, there is a real roughness to his style right now that I, I don't think a lot of people are doing. So, yeah, I, th I think stock up for him, for sure. At least on my end. Yeah, I mean, I definitely, like, the, obviously, like, the power bomb really got over in this tournament. That was, like, yeah, became, like, power a power bomb, right? Yeah. Um, I'm not as high on him as you. I, to me, there's a... The issue with me with Finley is something that maybe isn't entirely out of isn't entirely under his control um if you were to ask me like david finley as a wrestler like just as a pure talent mm -hmm. and like how would you rate him i'd be like eh, like seven out of ten like pretty good sure um i just i think like he's the leader of the bullet club he's not at the same level he's not close to the same level as the previous leaders of the bullet club right and it just kind of comes across as like a bad message from New Japan. It's like New Japan is 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 f so far from its peak that David Finley is the leader of the Bullet Club when he used to be like AJ Styles and Kenny Omega, or Jay White, right? I don't know. Guys with the abs. I think he's closer to Jay. I think he's closer to Jay White, but you know, it is yeah. the, the message taken. Like you know, so, he's that's definitely that's not kinda, that the other one, right? Yeah. So that's it's kind of like out of that's kind of like out of his control. Where I feel like it's and it's not even like he's pushed too hard because he's not really he's not pushed as hard as those other guys were no um, no it really isn't so it's not like necessarily a consequence of his push it's more of just like that it's hard if he makes him feel kind of second rate even if as a wrestler he's pretty good right um and that's kind of beyond his control i get that um sure and 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 to that to your point too like i'm not saying that he felt that way i'm saying like i think he's improved dramatically since like late 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 last year mm -hmm. whereas like what you're saying like aj styles becomes new japan or bullet club leader and instantly he's you know revitalizes his career 
you know, Kenny Omega well, takes over and instantly he's great. Like Jay White even was able to take over and like it took David Finley longer, but like you can't be thrust into that position and then take your time figuring it out. Yeah, and there's but that's like what said, they that's where they put him. Yeah, there's some been some stop and start kind of things with his career. Yeah, yeah. Really pretty much since he started in New Japan, like Yeah. Um he cuz he probably started right around the same time as Jay White. I think so. Um, yeah. And think of how like much has happened in Jay White's career compared to relatively what has happened in David Finley's career. Um, and, you know, he's always been internally rumored to about to be going to WWE. Um, but yeah, like, I think he's pretty good. Um, like when you saying like he's, you have him second um, in the tournament based on average match rating, which, you know, isn't you saying he's the second best wrestler in the company just happened to be what his out performance was um that's like pretty shocking to me um but obviously um i guess when i think about it i can see how you got there like he did have a lot of above average matches in this tournament even if i was maybe a little bit lower on them than you yeah like if i was like you know obviously i think anytime you do numbers it's like all right this is what the numbers say but now it's time to put a human element to it and, yeah, no, you know, I know it's like, interesting. It's interesting. Yeah, like it's interesting you got there. Like, like I said, it's different than you saying like, oh yeah, I think he's better than Shingo or I think he's better than Kaneske Takeshita. Right. But the fact is, you know, at the end of the day, you looked at your match ratings. You're like, wow, you know, David Finley's second highest. You know, that that does say something um, beyond just, you know, your own personal thoughts. You, like you're kind of getting away, even though it's your own ratings, you're kind of getting away from personal bias by just saying like, look, yeah. he had a really strong tournament. Yeah, and I think, like, for him, I mean, obviously, I probably, I think, like, obviously, nobody else probably has him that high, at least as far as the numbers go. But I'd be surprised, like, I wouldn't be surprised if, like, when people looked at, you know, if they keep track of their numbers, or if they thought about the numbers, if he wouldn't be higher than people expected him to be, which, you know, obviously, then you'd say, like, you know, obviously, like, I even put Gabe Kidd above him or some other guys. But I do feel like it does say something for, like, his progression that, you know, as somebody who isn't really taken as seriously in the ring that he he probably should be for somebody in his position, you know, it, it's getting quite a bit better. And he is only 31, so he's a lot younger than you'd probably think for how long he's been around. So, you know, it might be something just to keep an eye on that, you know, at least just like keeping an open mind on David Finley, I guess. I think a lot of people are, but like, I, I think be ready to give him a little bit more you know, authenticity than, than he has right now. How about his uh, little cohort there, Gabe Kidd? Oh, this is really tricky because it's like, who do you say has the most stock up? And Gabe Kidd is a very strong argument for the most stock up and probably a good example of why, like, you know, unless you advance, your standings don't really matter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, you could get and this is, if you pinned a champion or something like like Okan pinned Naito, so he's getting that title right. match. And and keep in mind, you know, if anybody goes to the Wikipedia page, I spent Friday at the mechanics. Well, uh, you know, got the day off work. I actually put in footnotes uh, for every like unbreakable tie for <laughs> on the G1 Climax page, just so like I know next year, like no, this person isn't actually sixth place; they're tied for sixth place. And Sansa told me I was an idiot, and I probably am. But, because it doesn't really matter what place you are. Like, Gabe Kidd was technically eighth in A block. And nobody would have him eighth if you were just ranking people, like, from the block. Unless you, like, truly despise him personally. You know, like, I actually, believe it or not, had the Gabe Kidd evil match from night one at four and a half stars. And I went back and watched it, and I probably wouldn't give it four and a half stars now. But, like, in the moment, at Edion, with that crowd, and just the way that those two fed off each other, like, you know, it's like, um, for all the things you, people say about Dave and, and stuff, like, some of the most uh, overrated matches that Dave's ever overrated are WWE matches that he attended live. It's just, like, when you're in the moment, like, you know, you capture that moment. And, like, Gabe Kidd is... Gabe Kid showed that he is world title level. Like he can reach that level because the, the crowd response to him is, you know, it's on par with Suji, I think. And I think it's just going to grow bigger. And he just has like a, an aura to him. Like he's a madman, 
if you didn't know. Yeah, I think Gabe has that this kind of intense physicality, like c- yeah. to compare him to Finley, like that Finley doesn't have, which gives Kid a much higher ceiling, especially in a company like New Japan. Like mm-hmm. Gabe feels like a tough, badass New Japan wrestler that like if he wrestles some if he were to go somewhere and wrestle somebody else like outside of New Japan like he would just stiff the shit out of that person and that person would be like oh yeah what the fuck is this guy doing and i like <laughs> well, and, I, and, I, and, I, and i like that um well he did almost kill somebody this year but <laughs> yeah yeah um he paid for it yeah um but i like just the, and there's an out like there's an element of danger to him oh yeah, yeah. the unstability the instability both in the un- unsureness of how much of it is a work, how much of it is a shoot, how much of it is a mm-hmm. mixture of both adds like this really kind of crazy element to his matches where it's like, I literally have no idea what this guy is going to do. Um, yeah. Which makes them more exciting. Uh, mm-hmm. I am in the camp. Like he's got to tone it down. Like the, he's got to <laughs> tone the shit down and like, he has a bit. Right. And I, I guess a little like, bit. Pe- people discuss this like it's a like a like a fine line. Like, oh, you got to go right up to that line, and it's great work. Um, but you know, then it's 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 you know, you just go a little bit over, and it's ruined. I don't really get that. Like, I just need him to be like, cut some of this stupid shit out. Like, <laughs> I know this wasn't in the G one, but there's a match where like. He's like beating up. He has a singles match to beating up a guy, and then he's like, "I'm gonna go like into the crowd, go behind the railing, and give like the timekeeper a brainbuster on the floor, you know, for no reason because I'm a madman." Right. And it's like, can we not do that? Because I feel like that's something you can clearly not do because that's like stupid fake bullshit. Where it's like, if guy was actually in a wrestling match, he wouldn't take the time to then go assault a random person just to prove that he's crazy. Um, that's the kind of stuff I want to see him get rid of. Um, but you know, outside of that, like he has pretty much as much potential as anyone else in this company. Oh, sure. And, and uh, like, I don't think like, you know, I enjoy it, but like, I don't think, I don't think it necessarily like takes away from what he does. It's just some some weird thing that he does that like, you know, it may amuse you or wouldn't, but like, I think like he is excessive about it. Obviously, I, I probably think that's a direction. I don't think just naturally he would scream his catchphrase into the, the microphone or the camera as often and as relentlessly as he did without some sort of, you know, direction to do that. No, it, it has it has worked in spite of that. Knowing and Japan, I think he's toning it down a bit. Yeah, huh? I feel like Jado and Gato are just like backstage when they see him. They're just like, mad, 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 mad. And like, he's like, okay. Yeah, no subtlety. Yeah. No subtlety. Um, and, and you know, I think I think you're right. I think there's like a level of like capriciousness to what he does, where it does feel dangerous. And obviously, like he did seriously hurt somebody this year, and he paid a price for it. Because like, I mean, we're talking about Mad Men. I mean, I don't think. I mean, obviously, like a lot of people have talked about it. I just don't think we can talk enough about how insane Hanare is for basically like his brain's falling out, and he just sort of gets like wrapped up with gauze probably just so he can go fucking cream Gabe in the ring with that chair and then going out for drinks afterwards too I mean holy fuck but you know I think like Gabe is somebody who's very unpredictable and I think you're right I think like him and Finley go for that intensity but Finley goes for like sort of like this composed smoldering version of it and you know, Gabe just evokes a more visceral reaction. Yeah, I feel like Gabe is someone, if you were showing someone New Japan or taking someone to a show who was unfamiliar with New Japan or maybe pro wrestling altogether, and they saw like David Finley and Gabe Kidd, I think Gabe Kidd would grab them a lot more. That doesn't necessarily mean that Gabe Kidd is better than David Finley, but I just think Gabe has something that's so much more easily marketable and, Mm -hmm. uh, appreciable and he just he feels like a pro wrestler in a really fundamental way in terms of like how he carries himself that 
with that. Not like it's not it's not just to compare him to Finley, like most guys don't have. Right. Um, yeah, and, and I think with him, it's also like he's doing it all because when he's in between the ropes, I feel like his matches just themselves, when they finally get in the ring, are still really good. Like he's just mm -hmm. an awesome wrestler on top of that. Yeah, like I said, like he's he doesn't got... need to leave the ring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he is a, as a worker, he's really good. Like he's got his stuff looks good. His you know he, he, really he hits stiff. He can sell. Like, he's oh not... my god. Yeah, he's un. His... He's like sometimes these guys that kind of carry themselves like Gabe can. Sometimes they can be kind of selfish in the ring. I don't get the sense with him right. like that. Oh no. Well, you know, I, I was just talking about this to John and and Chris. You know who he reminds me of more than anything, and I think it's kind of obvious, especially when you talk about his selling. He's fucking Terry Funk. Like, if you watch his selling, it is classic Terry Funk selling, especially when he's doing like the wobbles or, or like the mm -hmm. comedy stuff. He's fucking Terry Funk. He's the closest thing we've got to it right now. And I, I think don't he's know. Just gonna get better. What about Dory Funk? He's still wrestling. <sighs> Speaking of Onita. <laughs> Holy fuck. I don't know. You said the closest God bless thing to him. Terry Funk, but Dory Funk's still out there. That's true. That's true. He took a fucking baseball bat. Those gimmick baseball bats. I love it. Onita is yeah. just the best. Yeah. Oh, I will not watch that match, but like, and it was probably no, no. ultimately bad that it took place like from like a humanity stand perspective. But I, I saw that on my, uh, someone uh, told me about that yesterday. I didn't even know it was happening. And I was like, I'm glad. I'm glad Dory Funk Jr. still had a match, even though it probably wasn't a good idea. No. And, and, and teaming with Nishimura, who's like kind of sick. So kind of sick, wasn't he? Like in a coma, like a month ago. Yeah, like a, he's well, the cancer, and, and it's just. Well, I mean, I guess it's two ways to look at it. Because, like, on one hand, I'm like, why should these guys be in the ring? But on the other hand, I do kind of think like it's a nice thing for them to you know get out there and work together again, especially when yeah. one of them is is kind of in rough shape right now, just yeah. beyond like age. So, yeah, that happened. How about Takai Watanabe? Um, he's like, he's like, like impervious to, to analysis, right? Yeah, Criticism. Right. Like, how do you, he's... how do you judge him? Remember when he was just Watanabe? Well, uh, yeah, I do. And I also remember when he was just evil before this, I was always sort of under impressed and disappointed with him. Like I felt like coming into the pandemic, he was a very disappointing wrestler who underachieved like especially like in the 2018 G1 where he was in the block with Tanahashi and Okada. And I thought he's the guy that's going to make the move. And he didn't like, he was just there. And I just never thought it was going to happen with what him. What year did he beat Okada in the G1? That's my favorite match of his of all time. Uh, good question. It wasn't that year. I know that for sure. Um, Cause that's, that to me was like, a ceiling match for him. It's like, you know, this guy's really good. And he's had moments here and there throughout his career where he's kind of, you know, he's had a main event of a, of a, you mentioned the, um, the match he had um, against Gabe Kidd on the first night of the D one. Like he has these moments where he's like, Ooh, man, you know, this guy's really good, oh. but he's weighed down by the stuff we mentioned with Renner though. I think interesting. You bring that up. Uh, 2017, actually. That was, yeah, that was, I knew, when you said 2018, I'm like, didn't he beat Okada in that G1? But that was the year before. No, that's, you know what, now that you, you've, uh, the memories are kind of coming back to me. Yeah, that's why I went into that G1 thinking, like, Evil's gonna make a big leap here. And he didn't. And then, you know, all the, the House of Torture stuff developed. And, you know, I, I would say this, um... I was very upset at the beginning of the year because I feel like House of Torture works to a certain level. Like, oh, toward Jim. Maybe even Eddie on. But once you get past, like, a five or 6,000 seat place, which is obviously very good, but, like, you're not gonna, like, run Leah Goku with him, right? And obviously we found that out against Sonata because it's like, they did not draw very well at Leah Goku. Uh, in fact, at Destruction, for that fucking Lumberjack match, you know, they drew 5,000, which obviously, you know, it's usually a down period anyway, but it's like, you know, they they work to a certain level. Like, you put them in Corican, and it's usually very good. You know, 
but you know most of the time it just feels like you know they do something very dramatic very obvious some sort of clue to the crowd to boo for three or four seconds and it feels very pavlovian but evil i think has transcended that a bit because he's definitely leaned more into sort of the comedy aspects of this um and like he's sort of become this delusional heel character where I don't think he was necessarily like totally this overt about it where like he literally thinks he's the president now or he, you know, he literally thinks he can just make his own matches or he's like forcing, you know, uh, Abe to read nonsense before a match. So I think it works on that level. I think his wrestling is actually better than it's ever been. Like, you know, bell to bell when he's actually wrestling, I think he's, he's, you know, gotten much much better yeah than i think he he's was, probably like, un, i think he's probably underrated like in terms of bell to bell and it's like kind of like the company's own fault for the reason he's underrated yeah because of his match the matches are all structured in a way to make you not think about his in-ring work but i've never really had a problem with him like as a wrestler mm. um i want to we got to speed along here because i do have to wrap sure. this up uh, <laughs> uh last four guys here uh yoda suji we already kind of talked about him a lot my one take on yoda up yeah, my one take on Yoda Suji is that I don't love the Gene Blast as a finisher. I just there's too many guys thank who do you. spears as finishers. I never want to see another you. spear again. Like it's it's like the well, most overused also, finisher in wrestling. Also, he doesn't even do the best one in the company. No. Like Hanari does the one where he lifts. Like other guys do it better than him or as good. And like it's just a lame finisher. It's just not a fun finisher. I think he could, you know, do better. I think it's just kind of like like when he did Uemura's finisher, which is also a bad finisher. But that was like a really cool moment in the, the semifinal against Finley. Even though I kind of felt like the Finley match was a bit absurd because he like basically ate every big move and finish that Finley had and then just like, you know, just beat him. But regardless of that, the crowd liked it. You know, I feel like he's like, so I don't know what his character is supposed to be because he's sort of like this like monster guy, like Gojira thing, but like he's always doing that like disingenuous smile. But then it turns out like he is very sincere. Like in the back, he always gives like these very like poignant backstage comments, especially about Uemura, even when they were feuding. So I think he's just an example of like, if you have a cool look and you're, and you like, know what you're doing and you're pushed to a certain level in a very like strategic way you know it just works even if like all the elements don't really fit together it just works he's just a guy that it's always going to work for mm -hmm. uh konosuke takeshita the only man in this tournament who is not officially a new japan wrestler before the tournament when i did the preview for b block i said he was the best wrestler in the world uh and he went out and showed it. Simple as that. Like, I legitimately think he is number one. I'd put him above everybody. Mm -hmm. And I think, like, his age, because he's not even, he's, like, 29 or 30. Um, he's got that DDT background, which does, like, produce, like, like really great wrestlers who have a lot of eclecticism. Like, he's done the comedy stuff. Yeah, he's first done style. the big match first stuff. Yeah. And... Yeah, I, I just think, like, he came in this tournament and showed, you know, hopefully, like, this is what the finished product of all the new guys are going to be. But he had a big, like, head start on all of these guys. And, like, he just showed, like, this is what you want these guys to be at. Like, he is, he's just simply the best. He can do everything. Yeah, I mean, I've heard people say, like, um... Like, he's come in here and he's kind of, ex like, exposed New Japan's star development system a little bit. In he terms could of have, like... but they, they, I think they, I think that could have happened and I was worried that was going to happen. But I think they stepped up in, in especially Suji, in response to him because he could have ate them up easily. Yeah, well, I, I think it's also, that's, like, coming from a real negative perspective in terms of, like, like, oh, Takeshita came in and he showed everyone else up. I'm like, well, like, he's, like, Takanosuke Takeshita. Like, it's, I don't think it's necessarily New Japan's an issue that they don't have someone that's as good as Konosuke Takeshita because like nobody is as good as Konosuke Takeshita. No, it's well, like... and they also like, Yuya Uemura isn't in that place yet. Like it would no. be like if Konosuke Takeshita came into the G1 in 2018. 
Yeah, like, Takeshita was great, but he wasn't this yet. Yeah, and you know, he started, you know, in a promotion that was willing to push a teenager. And, 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 and you know, yeah. the, stake, the stakes of pushing a teenager for DDT were not sim- would, were very different than like the stakes of like New Japan pushing a teenager in terms of like right. when you're starting out with like a smaller promotion, you're you can take more risks in terms of who we're gonna push on top. Um, but yeah, I mean, he's yeah. I, I said halfway through the tournament that I think he's you know I said he was the best Japanese wrestler in the world. Um, he's as good as anyone else in the world. Um, and you really, for for anyone that's actually watched him, like I would find it hard to believe that they would disagree with that assertion. Like, no, no, I've, no. I've almost heard just like I can't, I, yeah. I can't even really recall ever seeing, and I and I, I'm around some some cynical fucks. I can't even remember seeing <laughs> some like slander of Kanosuke Takeshita. Um, no, he, he the last has a feel. He really yeah. does. Last two guys, uh, Shingo Takaki. Oh, and by the way, one more thing on Takeshita. During the tournament, he wrestled at Peter Pan and had a really great match with Masato Tanaka. Just so, on the side. Yeah, just on the side. Just on the side. Yeah. yeah. That was a great match. Yeah. So, uh, Shingo. See, this is where stock up sucks down is tricky yeah. because Shingo's he's like... Sh- he's Shingo. He's fucking Shingo Tanaka. I-, I said it on the on the Omakase and I'm saying it here. We got Ishii in the Hall of Fame. And like I'm fine with the idea that the Wrestling Observer Hall of Fame is basically just like so like it's drawing and and maybe something else. So Shingo, like I think Shingo could probably have a draw case too, but like you know, like the, the floodgates opening because Ishii gets in and now every work rate guy's gonna get in. It's like fine. Like I don't think that. It's just special cases. And yeah, Shingo's every, a special case. Yeah, not every Shingo's a special guy. case. Like he's so he's so far like a historical work rate guy that he, he's just got to get in and like he's still doing it like i thought i was kind of down on him coming into this g1 because i didn't really like the hanari match i thought that they just did the the no sell spot too much and it seemed like he was sort of sort of aimless but he he knocked it out of the park again yeah in every I, way. I, well that's why i think i would say for the the purposes of this exercise stock up in terms of i feel like he was kind yeah, of okay I'll say stock i feel up. like yeah i, I mean his performances to me are always top notch, but I do feel like he was his, his performance and how he was kind of protected in this tournament um, and put into the, you know, the semifinals and things like that um, were uh, really excellent for him. Cause you know, he's kind of in a weird place because he had that world title run, but it was really during like the pandemic and just yeah. like, it wasn't proper in any way. And no. it's kind of like disappointing that that's the time they decided to go like all the way with Jingo um i know and you, you know you know who who else in the ring in this company is like even close to shingo's level like in this tournament i thought easily the three best wrestlers in this tournament i will hear like almost like for for me super obvious were zach kanosuke uh Takeshita, and shingo um, oh yeah i think that's probably consensus and just like who are the actual best wrestlers in this tournament um, oh yeah yeah, and it's not like Shingo isn't over. It's not like the crowd doesn't buy him as a as a legit guy. So um, there's nothing. I'd, I'd be interested. I gotta talk to John about this because I'm very interested in what the Japanese fan perceives him as. Because I perceive him at this point like, I mean, obviously Naito is the leader of Lij, but he does kind of feel like a, a almost level of like the top guy faction leader. Like it feels like he's at that level. He just has like the ultimate leader in his group above him. Yeah, well, like he was was like like I mean, again, it was during the pandemic, but he was the world champion. Like, yeah, he's like you know for a long he, time too. Yeah, like he's 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 a legit top guy in the company, I guess. And so it's kind of yeah, it is. I mean, and I also think like the dynamics of Lij are a little bit different than like the dynamics of your maybe some of the other promotion, the other groups yeah. in the company in terms of who like yeah. the top guy is. Um, and lastly, he just came up. Last guy is Tetsuya Naito. Um, uh, had a divisive tournament, I would say. <laughs> yes, he did. I I would have to say stock down. Um, if I could Jay Billis it up here, is it because he's he can't got hit his no? Finish? He's we uh, yeah yeah that's kind of a big deal. He's got and it's not even just his finish. There's a reason why he can't do his finish anymore. Like I said, let me Jay Billis it up here. He has no burst. There's no burst in his legs anymore. 
he needs a rest because he can't like he can't get over the top rope consistently to do the combination cabron which he doesn't even do at any like every match anymore because like he was stumbling over the top rope like he just doesn't have the lift so like you know obviously it's a move where the guy taking it has to basically lift him over them but it's not dead weight like naito has to sort of get to a certain point where they can get him and he can't reach that every time anymore and obviously like if there's communication issues like you know him and jake lee seem to be sort of slightly misaligned like not like a disaster but like it seemed like they were a bit not totally aligned with each other oh, it becomes I... a real catastrophe yeah I think Naito and, Jake, Naito and Jake Lee was like the worst big match I can recall seeing in quite a long time. You know, and I, and I felt bad for him because it's like, it, you know, it wasn't like, oh, these guys are incapable of doing it or I don't even think they can have a good match together. It just seemed like they no, just, just got like misaligned somewhere yeah, and it just, took them a while to get back on track. It, it just fell apart. And sometimes people take these things like too personally. I'm like, how could you say Naito had the worst match you've seen in years? And it's like, it's not like I'm like I'm a huge Tetsuya Naito fan. I voted him for the Hall of Fame every year until he got in. Um, I think as an in-ring worker, he's really underrated throughout his career in terms of the way people talk sure. about him. Um, I'm great. Yeah, yeah, le- legitimately. Um, so like I'm not by no means like a Naito hater, but it's like that match was a complete disaster, and I don't know how anyone yeah. can say otherwise. Like no, it just is what it is. And if you love Naito, you can just blame Jake Lee. That's that's a cool spot to play. To, to um park blame it's just yeah, yeah I, mean, I mean it's 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 deflating right because it's like he's not tanahashi level and i i honestly feel like he just needs a little bit of rest yeah i mean he like his legs are totally shot right now mm-hmm. and honestly like talk about the eye like he's had so many surgeries on his eye that they can't do that anymore like once the, once it goes awry again he's done he can't have that surgery again you know like and this is partially him. Like, I, I think it's him just wanting to be on every show so he doesn't take tours off and he's on tours that he probably doesn't need to be on. You know, I mean, even then he was, I still had a bunch of his matches at like four stars or about that. Yeah. yeah like I was gonna say like his first two matches of the tournament, like Shin, you know, versus Shingo and versus Zach were like in a vacuum, like yeah. really good matches, but he did not look good in those matches. Right. Which well, was the like, end for sure. Right. Yeah, which was like this kind of, I mean, the Zack match was a little bit better because it didn't rely on like explosiveness, but he was in there with Shingo and Shingo's wrestling Shingo's match, which, you know, he's hit, hitting right. the ring and, you know, there's a lot of bumps and athleticism that's required in a Shingo match. And it's just like kind of, it was almost kind of cruel to see Naito out there. And look, there's right. pressure on him. Like we talked about, he's easily the biggest star in the company. He's easily the biggest draw in the company. Um, oh, yeah. The roster doesn't have the depth of star power that it had uh, even, you know, last year. Um so there's a lot more pressure for him to be on these shows and it's just a tough spot to be in because like you said, he's physically with, with, with Tanahashi, I feel like there was a really gradual decline really dating back to like right. the bicep injury. He never had surgery on where yeah. he went from being, you know, one of the best wrestlers in the world to being like pretty good to being like, Oh, he can summon it once in a while to being just kind of like, okay, this is, you know, he's now like full blown, like late stage Muda kind of stage of yeah. his career. Um, yeah. Where, like, run to a mound. Yeah, where, like, none of his bodies work. Um, none of his body parts work. And with Naito, it felt like, it, just because, of, like, the exertion, it felt like it kind of happened a little bit faster, um, which is a little bit wonder, uh, troublesome. And But it's just, um, and so it's, like, the issue with Naito is, like, I don't want to, I don't want to put all this, like, blame on him. It's kind of, like, that's, like, a mean thing to say because he's out there working hurt and busting his ass but when you are the biggest star in the company when you're the world champion when you're headlining all these shows like your in-ring performance is going to be criticized sure and that's just the state of where he would he's at now um they're in they're gonna i mean he'll get more rest because he's not working the grind of a g1 but they they're gonna they're gonna need him over the next six months and probably right. beyond that like um i will we'll wrap up with this because i do i do need to watch this Wembley stadium show it starts in four minutes sure. um but real quick you 
the Gato is Gato was just fired hypothet hypothetically. Gato is. Oh, fired. can I just say what? Uh, sorry, I, I know I don't want to keep you from that. I, I one minute just on the you mentioned um, yeah. the attendances before. Mm -hmm. I just want to say this because I've done a ridiculous amount of work this week, like literally going over seating charts and like square footage and like figuring out like not the like like the website attendance that you see on these Japanese venue sites, but like what I think the real uh, capacity is for wrestling. So mm -hmm. like this year they did about 48,000 something. Um, and last year they did 53. So they're down 5,000. Just to give a little bit of uh, insight to that though, um, the capacity was way down. So like last year, at least by my calculations, somewhere in the range of 95,000 people, total capacity, all the venues combined. And this year it was about 80,000. So they did quite a bit better capacity, but they did run smaller venues. So it, it you know, ultimately they're down like a half, 50% of what they were in 2019. But, you know, there's just a little bit of nuance to that. It's still down and still down from last year, but, you know, the capacity is a little bit better looking. Yes. Um... While you were talking, I was able to pull up the pay-per-view on my phone so we can keep going a little bit longer. Um, <laughs> but Go yeah, ahead. no, I, I, I would say like from an attendance perspective, um, the, uh, that the, I would consider this like a big success. Look, you lose your biggest established star or, or at least Okada like on the same level as Naito. Mm -hmm. um, and you lose Osprey, who is maybe your biggest, you know, rising star or younger star. And it's like your attendance isn't going to be the same. Um so I would consider that like a success. I would say like the position where they are business-wise is fine. It's not yeah. like record setting or anything like that, but I would say it's They're fine. They're producing revenue. Yeah. And when you consider the losses in terms of talent, um, and, and maybe sure. some of those losses in terms of talent are related to like revenue and like the company's not making the same amount of money. They can't financially compete with other companies. And the, I mean, there's a whole, sure. you know, it's, it's more... The American companies have so much money that it's hard even for like peak New Japan to compete financially. Um, well, and also like if you if you really want to hang your hat on something optimistic, and I do think like this is a key point. Um, Zebio Arena Sendai, I think, is one of their key arenas going forward. Um, I, I think it opened at the beginning of the pandemic, so they've only been running it since 2020. Um, and it's about a 4000 seater. And I, I estimate they could probably fit about 3500 in there. They just did their best number at that arena, which they've run about seven or eight times. Like this is a this is a new like rotation venue. And that number, which is their best in that arena, was headlined by Suji Uemura. So mm -hmm. I think that's a very promising like that was one where it's like, okay, I think this might be working. Yeah, no, for sure. I, I noticed that too when that um that match took place that that drew really well which is really important yeah. um because it does too, right yeah. yeah well when we talk about like there's a pressure on naito to be on all these shows because of his drawing power relative to everyone else on the roster um and if you can take that pressure off of him and he can maybe take some time off which you know he's a psycho he might not take the time off anyway um <laughs> you know yeah, that, that we you talk the mentality is just different there we talk about you know and hare hanare you know gluing his head back together um, right. Tanahashi, I mentioned, you know, Tanahashi's career, I think the downfall of him physically came from when he tore that bicep. I forget what year that was. It's probably like what, like 2017, 2018. Remember when he tore the bicep and, and, he, and then he like worked yeah. the whole G1. And I think that worked was like, G1, right? you know, he had a huge wrap on and I don't think that wrap like ever came off. Like I just, I think that was like the beginning of the end. Um, and that was during a time no. where there was. Like that was yeah. that was during a time where there was a lot more depth to the roster in terms of like you know Tanahashi right. you might maybe could take some time off so you don't have to uh, kill yourself but you know the mentality is different. Um, yeah, it's funny. I I, uh, I mean I'm sure you remember the match with Kenta at Wrestle Kingdom where he went off the ladder and did the high yeah. five blow. Neither one of those guys has been the same since that match. I mean Kenta was already sort of broken down, but it's been bad and kind of for both of them, isn't it? Yeah, it's under. Yeah, it's it's hard to tell. Like, was that match like really the end for them, or is it just like their bodies were? I mean, both of those guys were already turning. I mean, Kenta, Kenta, it's hard to tell. Kenta's body broke down, and 
Yeah, he's all gimmick now. Uh, yeah, and I don't know if Kenta has the same kind of spirit that like Tanahashi has in terms of like Tanahashi, like if he physically could, would really, 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 really want to go out there and have like an amazing performance. I don't can't necessarily say the same about Kenta. Um, yeah, Kent, Kenta just wants to have cool backstage comments, which he is the best at. But you know, the, the ambition in ring seems to be significantly uh-huh. diminished. So my my hypothetical uh, here is. Gato is fired, and you were hired. Yeah. President oh, Tanahashi right. comes in and is like, "Jay oh. Michael, I've been reading all of your write-ups on VoiceOfWrestling.com, um, and I want you to have the book." And this, I, I, I kind of want to get this away. I don't want you to necessarily like fantasy book a whole angle because I don't really like fantasy booking. Mm-hmm. But just from an exercise perspective, what would the main event of Wrestle Kingdom be now that, like, with the with the knowledge that like it's not going to be Zach? Uh, yeah. Or, or Zach is not going to wrestle Naito for the title at Wrestle Kingdom like we thought right. when he won the G1. Well, number one, they're a fucking black company, so I would absolutely say no. Uh, number one. And by, by the way, I don't want to any, any of that misconstrued. That means like a toxic work company in Japan. Um, they definitely say that. I mean, the first thing I would do. I would fire Kikuchi for being a dickhead. I was going to say, you're going to clean bully. up. So the first thing you're going to do is clean up everyone. Bureaucratic bully dickhead, and he can go. But, um, I mean, honestly, so we're saying, like, I take the job after this G1, so I'm inheriting all of this? Yes. I just want to know, like, okay. who would you, like, I guess, I, like, who do you want to think, what do you think would be the best decision, all things considered, balancing, you know, knowing you need to draw, knowing that you maybe want to set something up for the future, what would be like the program you want to start 2025 off with headlining in New Japan? Well, I mean, if I'm being a pragmatist, it would probably be Naito and Suji. Mm -hmm. Because I think that would be the match that would give you the best of all worlds in that sense. Um, If I'm being uh, like an idealist, it would be Naito Goto. Because I just want that story to be told. And, you know, you can give Goto a few months. You know, let him lose to a New Japan Cup guy. But I, I think if I was trying to balance everything um, in a way that wasn't just... I, I guess it would probably be Suji, actually, now that I think about it. I think the other option is Naito Shingo, since that still is a very fresh match. You know, it's only happened twice. Uh, I think people would, would clamor for that one. I think, you know, the idea of, like, getting somebody out of LIJ and getting another faction... Since, like, you know, they tried to make new factions last year. Strong Style was a a disaster. Uh, Just a a complete catastrophe. Didn't work in any way. Kind of really gummied up Desperado, I feel. And obviously Narita, like, I mean, not that they didn't try. I mean, it was like fucking Lion King with, like, the the thing where, like, they both have their hand on his shoulder as he's looking back at the crowd. Um, And Just Five Guys has been, you know, very... (laughs) Very nondescript, um, as as I guess the gimmick entails. So I, I, I guess I guess uh, I guess either you know Naito and either Suji or Shingo, and I would try to like say like you know we're we're reaching like the salad years of the Lij thing, and it's time to probably like move in a different direction where it kind of becomes like like Great Bash Heel or something where it becomes Naito's sort of legacy faction. But everybody's sort of moving on from it, you yeah, know. So I, I guess I guess I'd go that way. I mean, obviously, like if you told me I got the job before the G one, it would be fucking Takeshita, no doubt. But if I'm inheriting this mess, then I am uh, probably having Naito beat Saber. Um, I don't care about the copper box, so I don't care about putting Zach the title on Zach for that show. Um, you know, wow, you are really letting the British have it on this podcast. I, you know, uh, there's some Olympic results that piss me off, obviously. Yeah, but so you and you and MJF are like this, right? Like real tight about the hatred of the British. Does he hate the British? Yeah, he's doing a gimmick where he hates the he he's the U at he 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 won the internet. You're gonna love this. He won the international championship and changed it to the American championship, and he's oh, going to what? defend it against Will Osprey. In Wembley Stadium, in like what two a hours. Camper Jersey prick, man. I would, um, yeah, I think I'd go that route. I think I'd do the LIJ thing. 
Yeah, I mean, New Japan does seem kind of, like, married to, like, the factions. Like, we talked about, like, LIJ has been around for years. Bullet Club's been around for, like, a decade. Chaos has been around even longer. <gasps> um, Another thing WWE stole. They finally started doing factions, and look how it went for them. Well, like, factions that last forever. Right. Which, like, WWE has done, do, done factions for a long time. But, like, the idea that, like, your factions have multi-generations of people in it. And, like, yeah. I don't know. It just it feels kind of, like... Part of it feels a little like I understand, like, like especially in terms of like Lij and Bullet Club, like there's merchandise dollars, and, and obviously Lij is still really popular, but it does feel like you're kind of like watching like almost like this relic from the past when it's like the roster's got all these new faces on it. There's a lot of established wrestlers that aren't around anymore. There's guys that retired. There are guys that moved to other companies. There are guys that have just kind of been phased out of any meaningful role. And yet the, the factions stay the same, almost like they're sports teams. Um, and like the, the 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 players on the teams change and stuff like that. Um, so it's pretty um, interesting. Like you said, they try to like, they try to create some new factions like last year and it went like horribly wrong. Yeah. Um, so um, I don't know what, if there's like a solution to that, but it makes, it makes the company feel kind of like, it, a little, it makes it feel dated a little bit that like we're still like in this this previous right. era of of factions instead of starting something new like this was dragon gate you know they would just the, the, they would break right. up they would and start something cycle new. it out yeah but yeah, I, 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 mean, I understand i understand why you wouldn't do that with like a thing like lij or or bullet club just because there's 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 so much money and and, and stuff still involved with that yeah i but i think like you know the beauty of factions is that you can bring people in. They sort of inherit the credibility of the faction they come into. Mm -hmm. So like Suji's the top new guy, but he was put into the top faction, right? But we've got to get him out of that. You know, it may be a bit soon like now, but like we've got to start pushing towards him being his own guy, you know, and, and, you know, whatever that ends up looking like, because he, you know, you've got to be a faction leader to, to be the guy. And I think him and Uomura need that eventually. You know, now that I think about it, this Uomura injury actually is probably a blessing in disguise, isn't it? Yeah, well, that's what I was like, thinking a little bit. It was thought. like, maybe maybe if they had huge plans for him in the fall or something like that, but when the company needs a shot in the arm, like late, like in the springtime or like late in the winter, like post Wrestle Kingdom, it would be a great right. time for him to show up and be like, oh yeah, because he, he, I think he went out, like it's part of the intrigue of like when he went out. Um, the same thing kind of happened to Cody when Cody like came back to WWE. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, you know, he was, he was getting really over and then like he got really badly injured and then he was able to come back like for the Royal Rumble, which kind of like was allowed him to kind of like recapture that momentum as opposed to maybe he would have gotten a little stale in between if he had been like just doing right. some like B feuds to kill time until he came back and won the Royal Rumble. Um, yeah. And, and, and I wonder like, so far, the new guys have just been guys who just face each other. And I wonder if this, like, is a little bit of a catalyst where one of them now has, like, a real story that people can get behind. You know what I mean? Like, it just shakes things up in that generation a bit. Where now you've got this guy who, who really has something to prove. And he gets that, you know, injury return boost that they could really do a lot with. Yeah, and I think it will come at, like, an advantageous time on the calendar. Um, too, as opposed to like in the fall, like I guess they care about the fall a lot more than they did. But usually, like post G one, really post, you know, once Kings of Pro Wrestling caused down, unless you're um, like really into the real world tag league, like it's time to check out New <laughs> Japan. I'll watch it, but you know, yeah, but you're not you're you're a sicko. I am. I am. Do you have anything? Do you have anything you want to? Yeah. Do you have anything you want to plug? Well, hold on, hold on. You had me put it out there, so I would go with those. What would you go with? They gave uh, me the book, the pencil. If I had the pencil, I mean, Suji versus Naito. I believe in Suji the most of the young guys, and I think Suji huh. should. Um, so, and I think you should use Wrestle Kingdom as an opportunity to elevate a guy to a higher level. Um, so you're not so reliant on uh, Naito uh, to yeah. do everything. And I like, there's some positive momentum. I, I really thought Suji. I thought some of the G1 matches Suji wrestled, they ended up really good, but the crowds were pretty quiet during the start of them. 
I thought um, that too. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. yeah. But by the end of them, they were getting like pretty over. And I thought like his last two matches, you know, were really strong atmosphere. So I do feel like there's some good momentum coming from, um, from that for him. Like, it's not just like, right. we're going to push this guy because we need to push somebody. I do feel like there's some organic momentum building up for him that the people will get behind. I think people generally like, it's obviously tough to replace older names, but you're at the point where you don't really have a choice because a lot of the old established right. names aren't around anymore. So, and I think people do, I, I, I think people generally want to see cool new names. Yeah. And, um, and I think it, I think what you're saying fits in historically too, because like, you just like, even if you're pushing these guys concurrently to each other, you need somebody to get there first. Like the original three musketeers, you know, they were generally just pushed along equally, but somebody got to a certain place first. Like I think Muto won the title first, Chono won the, the G1 first, you know? And then obviously famously, you know, they pushed Nakamura to the moon, which then gave Tanahashi and kind of Shibata, but especially Tanahashi, like the ultimate motivation, right? And now I think we've got that chance again. And I kind of feel like this is why when I say like, this is a, a real special G1, like you don't get these G1s very often where we're in this transition period and you're seeing these guys grow. Like, you know, my match of the tournament was Takeshita Suji night one because the atmosphere was just so incredible. And you legitimately felt like you were watching something special, like a real turning point in, you know, wherever we are right now. You know, you don't see that very often, especially between guys who aren't the same company at the moment. So, no, I, I think that I think what you're saying is totally accurate. I, I totally 100 percent behind it. Like we need to set that 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 plane so that everybody has their motivation set, too. All right, cool. Do you have anything you want to plug that we haven't discussed yet? Ooh. Well, people usually leave me alone, so uh, it doesn't seem to work. But I do have a an X. Got got I got the X. Uh, I am at Ryugu Joe, so it's a little pun on my name, but it's a R Y U G U underscore J O. I also have a secret podcast that I do with my best friend. We've been best friends since 1993. Uh, we don't promote it. I'm not even going to tell you what the name is. If you can find it, enjoy. Although it's probably pretty bad because it's just me going to his house and then he basically just has the microphone going and we just we just talk until we feel like we're done talking. All right. Thanks so it's much about for wrestling, but it, uh, okay, It's about yeah, wrestling, but it's about wrestling, but like we just did a show last night, actually, and uh, we actually didn't end up talking about wrestling. We just talked about the Olympics and I think ice cream for about two hours. So, oh, so it, was like the flag, it was like the flagship. <laughs> yep. So if you can find it, enjoy. All right. Excellent. Thanks so much, Jay Michael. Appreciate all the listeners. And we'll talk to you again after a while. Hi, I'm Case Lowe, co-host of the Open the Voice Gate podcast. The one question I'm constantly asked when it comes to Dragon Gate is how do I get into the promotion? Well, stop asking and start listening to the Open the Voice Gate podcast released every Wednesday on the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. For exclusive news and show reviews, look no further than the leader in Dragon Gate coverage, Open the Voice Gate.